that uh, you are all uh, you all had a wonderful lunch. So the set of our uh, professorial chair presenters in this afternoon will be started by Dr. Terence Tomolba. So his talk will be about performance testing of sodium CMC, HPC, sodium alginate hydrogels for agricultural applications. He is the recipient of Dr. Magdaleno B. Alvarazin Jr. Centennial Professorial Chair in Engineering. So let me just start recording our session today. All right. So again, welcome. let's welcome Dr. Terence. Thank you, Dr. Pilario, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Terence Tomalva, and I will be presenting my professorial chair lecture this afternoon. Um, Dr. Pilario, um, can I share my slides? Uh, yes. Hindi po ba, Sir Kaya? No, uh, okay lang kahit hindi ako co-host. Sorry, I'm not familiar. Uh, yes. Ayun, okay. Okay, so again, my, my lecture for this afternoon is entitled Performance Testing of Sodium Carboxymethyl Cellulose, Hydroxypropyl Cellulose, and Sodium Alginate Hydrogels for Agricultural Applications. So uh, just to give a background on this particular study, um, the rationale that we used to initiate our studies on agricultural hydrogels in my lab was due to the uh, occurrence of drought in our country. Okay, so having this um, statistics from the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council back in June 2019, you can see here the damages and losses uh, that we had incurred in our country due to the existence of drought or occurrence of drought. Now, I, I do have to emphasize that the use of hydrogels to uh, fight the, the effects of drought is only intended for mitigating the effects of the immediate impact of water scarcity, okay? So it's not really, uh, a solution to the long-term uh, effect of drought, but only to provide an emergency reservoir of water so that the farmers can be assured that their plants will not die uh, and will continue to receive uh, the, the water that they need. Uh, in the meantime, they have enough time to find or seek alternative sources of irrigation water. Okay, so um, our focus is on the use of hydrogels. And the reason why we wanted to use hydrogels is because they are proven to have very high water absorption capability. That's why most of them are considered as super absorbent materials and they are proven to be effective soil conditioners. What does that mean? Um, if you introduce soil in the, uh, uh, introduce hydrogels in the soil, um, you'll be able to manage the irrigation water properly. So you don't need to uh, put in excessive water that could uh, potentially lead to agricultural runoff. And you can also use hydrogels to control the release of fertilizers, which means Again, you don't need to introduce excessive amounts of fertilizers in the soil, which could lead to nutrient pollution. And lastly, uh, due to the swelling and disswelling activity of hydrogels while they are in the soil, um, the soil essentially becomes more porous, which leads to an increase in oxygen intake. Now, um, there are existing commercial hydrogels out there, but 
um, they are essentially synthetic or uh, made using petroleum-based polymers. So th they could uh, release toxic components when they are subject to environmental degradation. And because they are synthetic, they are non-biodegradable. So disposal can be an issue. So the solution for this is to utilize the bio-based hydrogels, which are non-toxic and biodegradable. So for this particular study, um, we will focus on the solution uh, cellulose-based hydrogels that we developed uh, back in 2019 uh, with my undergraduate students. Um, it says here it's 2020 because it was published uh, a year after. Okay, so we developed the hydrogel blend of sodium carboxymethylcellulose, hydroxypropyl cellulose, and sodium alginate. And the reason for that is because we wanted to uh, incorporate all the advantages that each component can, uh, can add into our hydrogel. So essentially, we are adding all of these advantages, pH sensitivity, ionic strength variation, uh, hydrogel strength, and temperature responsiveness. All mix them all up into a single material. Okay. So back in 2019, um, the blend uh, was the blend ratio was optimized. So that was the focus of our study back then. And the optimization was based on the characterization test that we did to understand uh, the blend's structures, properties, and functions. Because when you blend all of this, um, you need to determine which properties uh, were sacrificed. Okay. So the, optimi the optimized bl uh, blend ratio was uh, established, and that is the one that will be that is used in this current study that I'm presenting right now. Okay. So our recommendation back then is to investigate and further improve some ad additional properties that we think are relevant to the use of this particular hydrogel blend, such as reusability, water holding capacity in soil, and non-phytotoxicity, okay? So the, the recommendation back then is actually the basis of our objectives for this particular study that I'm presenting right now. So our general objective is to continue the performance testing on the hydrogel blend, and the performance tests that we conducted were the following, uh, water absorption, reusability, controlled nutrient release, water holding capacity, and non-phytotoxicity. So in order to synthesize the hydrogel beads, uh, we, again, we used the optimum blend ratio that we established back in 2019. So this is the blend ratio. And we essentially made the beads using uh, a procedure known as ionotropic gelation. So we added three weight percent of this polymer blend into a cross-linking aqueous solution of 5% aluminum sulfate. Okay, so the aluminum sulfate was uh, added to the water to serve as the cross-linking agent. Okay, so after the beads were formed, um, they were removed from the cross-linking solution and then wash, uh, washed further um, using distilled water so that the residual aluminum sulfate can be removed. Okay, so this is what the hydrogel beads look like. Um, they look like um, soft pearls. Okay, and then in order to establish um, its water holding capacity, we have to dry, in, dry them out. So this is what the hydrogels look like after drying, okay? So after we were done synthesizing the hydrogel beads, we performed the following uh, performance test. So the first 
property that we tested was the water absorption capacity. So it's basically a gravimetric test, okay, to see how much water can be absorbed by each uh, individual hydrogel bead. Okay. So this uh, this is the result of the water absorption capacity test that we did. So the upward curve can be used to establish the swelling and uh, swelling absorption kinetics. Okay, actually, it's not it's not really can be used. It, I, if I remember correctly, the data was in fact used by one of my master students, Mr. Paul Jake Nazaro, who is an instructor in our department, and he uh, he used this to. Uh, finish his master's thesis, which he successfully defended last June. Okay, uh, but essentially the water absorption capacity is based on the uh, the maximum uh, level of the percent swelling. Okay, so here uh, the maximum swelling was established at around. 2,438%. So essentially, if a material uh, reaches up to one more than 1,000% of its original uh, mass after absorbing water, it can be considered as super absorbent. Okay. Um, the next, te uh, the next property that we tested was the reusability test. So it's basically a swelling and deswelling test. So these are the results of the test that we did. So essentially, um, we observed an 84% an net decrease in the swelling capacity after six cycles, okay? And the reason for that is because um, the intermolecular bonds that were initially formed uh, during the cross-linking, um, they were subjected to stress due to the consistent uh, absorption of water. And the effect is not reversible, okay? So when the, sweat, when the initial swelling happened, the macromolecules were separated, okay, uh, during swelling. But when the water was removed, they, the, the position did not return back to it, to their original uh, state, okay? So that's why essentially in time after continuous swelling and swelling, there is an observed decrease in performance. So this test is important to establish uh, how soon uh, should the hydrogel beads be replaced in the soil, okay? That's why we did this test. And then the next test is nutrient release, okay? So how we wanted to see how the nutrients can be absorbed and released by the hydrogel beads. So uh, based on our observation, the release of the nutrients follows that of the multi-stage diffusion of polymer coatings. So essentially, the, the nutrients first partially uh, dissolves in the water and then gets absorbed or enters the hydrogen, okay? They don't enter by themselves. Okay, the next test is the maximum water holding capacity. It's different from the water absorption capacity because this is, uh, in particular, testing the performance of the conditioned soil. So this refers to the, uh, the amount of water that can be held by the soil itself, okay? So this is the result. So um, there's a 16% increase in the maximum water holding capacity, okay? So essentially we are, we are concluding that, we are concluding that if we add hydrogels, there's an increase in the water holding capacity in the soil. Okay, 
And I think this is the last test, the non-phytotoxicity. Um, essentially, we wanted to see if adding the, the hydrogel beads in the soil would prove to be toxic to the plants when they are added, uh, when they are incorporated in the soil, okay? Or when we use the conditioned soil to grow the crops, okay? So these are the plants that we chose, pechai, alfalfa, broccoli, kale. I know um, these are not, with the exception of pechai, these are not exactly the typical vegetables you will see in, a, uh, in an average Filipino household. And there's a reason for that, okay? So these are the conditions that we set. Uh, and then we based our non-phytotoxicity result on the value on the value of the germination index. Okay, this is the formula for the germination index. It's basically based on the root length and the number of germinated seeds. Okay, so these are the results. Okay, so uh, the germination index was based on a U the USDA study. Essentially, when the value of the germination index is above 60%, then the, the material can be considered as non-phytotoxic. So as you can see, for all four uh, plants, um, the value of the G percent GI is above 60%, okay? And again, the reason why we chose these four plants uh, our crops is they are all considered high value crops. So we thought that um, these high value crops are more difficult to, to plant. So they are expensive. And if there is a problem with supply, they will be even more expensive. So for those of you who are familiar with the Ceiling Labuyo news, uh, a few years, a couple of years back, then you know what I'm talking about, okay? That's why we wanted to focus on this high value crops. Okay, and then uh, we also try to see if they can be used for soilless cultivation or uh, the plant that we chose is basil, okay? And these are the results of our study, okay? And uh, this is the conclusion that we derived from this particular study. Okay. Now, before I end my presentation, I would just like to acknowledge the OVCRD for providing us with the outright research grant that we, did, we used to fund this particular study and the ERDT for uh, allowing me to present this uh, in an international uh, conference and getting this published. Okay, and before, uh, lastly, I would like to acknowledge my three co-authors, the three bachelor students who did this study with me. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Terence Tomolba. The floor is now open for questions. You may raise your hand. Anyone? Sir Terence, I do have a question. Um, uh, have you compared uh, your hydrogel to other hydrogels, like uh, in terms of spending capacity and so on? Uh, no, um, not yet. We did not. Because for this particular study, um, we, we, ran, uh, we ran out of time. Uh, because this was done in academic year 2019-2020. So as you may recall, pandemics yes. uh, struck back in March 2020. So no oras. Yes, I agree. It's very difficult. <laughs> so anyone else who have who has a question? All right. Yes, they're being done. Um, I thank you, Dr. Terence, for that wonderful presentation and good luck on your research. Thank you, Sir Carl. Thank you. All right, so um, that was uh, Sir Terence, the recipient of the Dr. Magdaleno P. Alvarazin Jr. Centennial Professorial Chair in Engineering. Our next speaker is Dr. Jem Valerie Perez. 
and her research is titled Stagome Lattice, the missing member of the Star Kagome family. She is the recipient of the Robert Chang Euratex Professorial Chair. And uh, are you now ready, Ma'am Jam? Yes, sir, I'm ready. I hope you can hear me and the uh, screen share is full screen na po ba? Ayan. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Full screen okay. and um, loud and clear po. You may proceed. Okay po. Thank you, Sir Carl, for the introduction. So I'm Dr. Jem Valerie Perez. And um, again, my presentation is about one of the outputs of my research work as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Houston under Dr. Alan Jacobson. And this work was published March of this year to Chemistry of Materials. And it is entitled... Um, Stogome Lattice, the missing member of the Star Kagome family. And uh, during my postdoc, I have gained training in crystallography and exploratory synthesis techniques. And I will discuss with you today the journey of how I uh, synthesize my new compound and briefly its magnetic properties because the characterization was done by uh, my collaborator slash mentor slash husband, Dr. Uh, Maurice Sorolla, who was also a postdoc of Dr. Jacobson while I was there. So I would like to thank uh, the UP Earth Fee and the donors of the Robert Cheng Eurotex uh, Professorial Chair for this opportunity to present our work today. So let me start with a borrowed concept in uh, mathematics, and um, this is called Archimedean tiling. That is, all polygons are regular and each vertex is surrounded by the same sequence of polygons. So we have uh, regular tilings like these three, uh, the three above, and the semi-regular tilings or uh, more than one regular polygons or more than one kind of regular polygons, itong mga uh, other eight. And uh, the notation is taken uh, to classify these lattices is just to list the type of polygon that um, forms each vertex and the times it appears. So for example, itong 4, 8 squared, it just means that each vertex is um, connected to or is surrounded by one square and two octagons. So parang ganon. And then um, particular example belonging to the class of Archimedean lattices is the well-known graphene uh, compound, which uh, resembles a honeycomb-like structure. So this uh, structure gives graphene its unique mix of structural, thermal, and electromagnetic properties. And we all know that um, graphene has attracted a great deal of attention for its potential role in adverse, uh, diverse range of future technologies. So additionally, beyond graphene, there are uh, many other synth synthesized materials with Archimedean lattices, and some are common, while some are rare. So in the field of chemistry and physics, and in the search of new magnetic phenomena, uh, layered materials comprising an array of metal centers arranged in geometrically frustrated triangles have been of great interest. So one uh, example is a class of compounds featuring the Kagome lattice as given by this uh, figure. So these compounds have been studied frequently and many phases are now known and are found to show a wide range of magnetic behavior. So one example is the gyrocyte family of compounds and uh, particularly the series of iron gyrocytes are reported to exhibit long-range magnetic ordering. Whereas um, Herbert Smithite is a prototype of a quantum spin liquid showing no magnetic ordering down to 50 millikelvin. So in this figure of uh, Herbert Smithite, um, the arrangement of the copper two ions um, form the Kagome network as shown in this uh, lattice figure. Um, in contrast to the Kagome system, two-dimensional materials with the star lattice as given by this figure are rare. And to date, only um, one uh, compound, this uh, compound uh, featured on the screen, is the only layered material where all the metal centers exclusively form the star lattice. And this copper to sulfate compound is a promising quantum spin liquid candidate. And this is um, a previous work of Dr. Sorolla. And then um, also materials with lattices intermediate between a uh, kagome and a star could also offer a fertile landscape for the exploration of interesting magnetic phenomena. So recently, 
two isostructural compounds with this rare octacagome lattice have been synthesized. So one is a uh, tellurium uh, version. It possesses a spin, ground, uh, spin gap ground state while the selenium analog um, exhibits antiferromagnetic ordering at low temperatures and both um, exhibit a distorted octacagome lattice. So we note that uh, these three previously mentioned lattice types are all uh, devoid of edge shared triangles, but they differ in the number of corners or vertices shared per triangle. So for star, for instance, if you can see at uh, figure B, um, we have no uh, corners or no vertices shared per triangle. So itong mga vertices ng triangle, hindi naka-share to other triangles. And then for octacagome naman, we have two vertices shared um, and one that is not. And then for kagome, we have all the vertices of the triangles being shared to other triangles. And missing from this uh, star kagome family of triangle-based lattices is a topology with only one vertex shared per triangle. And that is what we call or what we coined as stagome lattice. So to the best of our knowledge, no 2D material with the array of metal centers forming a stagome lattice has been prepared uh, to date. So in this study, we, we report the synthesis, crystal structure, and magnetic properties of a new layered compound with this previously unknown stagome lattice. So with regards to the exploratory synthesis of this cobalt stagome compound, um, I was working on synthesizing several other compounds, including uh, metal organic frameworks, and while trying to synthesize a cobalt analog of another compound, I serendipitously discovered this um, cobalt stagome compound during the exploratory synthesis. So during my 301st um, solvothermal reaction, I saw a mixed phase with two crystals. So initially, as you can see from this actual uh, photo, after the synthesis, you would think that these are just um, all the same and uh, the darker ones may just be aggregates of the other. But when I picked them and looked at them under the microscope, this is um, what they feature. So they have different morphologies. The lightly colored crystals are um, block crystals, while the darker or the amber colored uh, ones are um, acicular or blade type crystals. So the next thing that I did is to check the FTIR spectra of the two. And upon doing that, I saw that they have different um, spectra, uh, while um, the cobalt stagome one features sulfate peaks and the other has formate peaks. And then uh, comparing or looking at databases, um, the cobalt stagome spectrum is um, unknown, and while the other one is uh, already known, uh, given by this um, compound uh, formula. And then the next that I did is, since this is unknown, um, we subjected it to single crystal uh, measurements. And then while doing that, um, the lattice parameters obtained are unique and are previously unreported. And um, uh, although it's new, the compound is new, the structure that uh, was solved was not the one that I was expecting because, again, I was... Um, trying to synthesize a different compound. So I was sad then. I thought that I failed to synthesize the compound that I wanted. But when I uh, showed this to um, Sir Mao, he said that um, it might be an even more interesting one because it is a layered uh, compound. So uh, with that, uh, I pursued this uh, material throughout the remaining time uh, during my postdoc um, research. So the next step that I need to do since I have a new material now and it looks interesting, is to try to synthesize this um, as a pure phase and not just as an impurity. So I played with uh, different um, recipes or different parameters in the synthesis. And um, so at uh, 300 first reaction, after several more uh, reactions, I was able to synthesize bigger of the uh, cobalt stogome compounds. And at my 475th uh, reaction, I was able to uh, synthesize um, all of them as the cobalt stagome compound and no more of the other um, known uh, material. So uh, I played around with this um, recipe, the um, cobalt sulfate, uh, water, and DMF um, 
concentration or amount ratio and the temperature and the time of the reaction. So playing with or having knowledge with uh, kinetics and thermodynamics of these reactions, I was able to synthesize the uh, pure phase um, uh, material. And then um, to uh, see or to look at the crystal uh, photo of these um, cobalt stagome compounds, so they look like this, and uh, the final recipe is given on the screen. So the um, reaction of cobalt sulfate hydrate, uh, DMF, and water produces uh, aggregates of these uh, amber-colored uh, blade-type crystals um, at uh, the reaction at 110 degrees uh, was uh, produced these crystals after 12 days. And the hydrolysis of the DMF molecules generates the formate and the dimethyl ammonium ions in C2. And then the last step that I need to do is to confirm this pure phase using uh, powder XRD measurement. So um, the experimental PXRD pattern uh, confirms the simulated PXRD pattern based on the solved crystal structure data. So this uh, confirms that our um, crystal is pure phase and that the uh, measurements from the single crystal XRD are correct. So the next part are the results. So I'll discuss crystal structure and briefly the magnetic properties. So I also learned from my mentors in UH how to describe uh, crystal. So I hope you can uh, follow me with these um, figures. So our compound, our cobalt stagome compound crystallizes in the monoclinic space group. And um, it features this anionic uh, slab um, as featured in figure 2A. And there are three different crystallographic cobalt sites as given by different uh, pinkish colors uh, doon sa legend natin. And each cobalt atom is octahedrally coordinated to the oxygen atoms. And then if you look at figure B, um, each cobalt atom or two vertices of the cobalt one unit, itong dark uh, purple, uh, along the equatorial position are corner shared with the cobalt two units. And then... Um, the two opposite sides of each cobalt-1 unit along the equatorial plane are edge-shared naman with the cobalt-3 unit. So this um, uh, builds or assembles this uh, core as given by figure B. And then in figure C, you can see that the metal centers are linked together by three classes of ligands, hydroxyl groups, uh, formate groups, and sulfate groups. And... Um, the common vertex of the three cobalt octahedra constitutes a hydroxyl group, while opposite this hydroxyl is the sulfate ion, which simultaneously caps the three cobalt octahedra. And then the hydroxyl and the sulfate uh, groups alternate in position above and below the uh, core. And then um, the vertices of the cobalt-1 and cobalt-3 octahedra that are adjacent to the OH groups are connected to nearby vertices by the uh, formate bridging formate groups. Thus, this uh, building block as featured in figure 2C is constructed. And then figure 2D uh, shows how the building blocks are interconnected among each other since each uh, cobalt building block has four adjacent neighbors. And then every two uh, nearby building block is um, joined or these blocks are joined through edge sharing as uh, given by the bold black uh, lines. So they are joined through edge sharing of the cobalt 2 and cobalt 3 units. And in addition to the bridging formate ions discussed earlier, the cobalt 2 and cobalt 3 octahedra are also interlinked by capping formate groups. As such, the slab in figure 2A is generated. So in the, uh, crystal, in the crystal, uh, anionic slabs are separated by well-ordered um, dimethyl ammonium counter ions and water molecules, and there is only one slab per unit cell. So the metal centers within the slab are arranged in a distorted stagome lattice as featured in figure 2E. And um, you can see that um, in figure 2E, cobalt 1, cobalt 2, and cobalt 3 sites, they form scalene triangles. So this deviation from equilateral triangles lower the symmetry of the lattice, thereby doubling the repeating unit as um, represented by the gray um, area in figure 2E and figure 2A. So compared to a regular stagome lattice, which has five uh, total vertices, our cobalt stagome compound has 10 because of the 
um, distorted um, lattice. So this uh, cobalt stagome structure is previously unknown. And then again, to investigate the magnetic behavior of our cobalt stagome compound, temperature-dependent magnetic susceptibility and heat capacity measurements were performed by Dr. Sarola, who is my co-first author in the uh, paper. So the magnetization data was obtained using, using a quantum design model, 6,000 ppms. And then in the range of around 150 to uh, 300 Kelvin in figure uh, 3a, uh, we can see that um, there is or the function of temperature, the inverse molecular susceptibility as a function of temperature obeys the Curie-Weiss law with a negative Weiss constant suggesting a dominant antiferromagnetic interaction between neighboring cobalt-2 ions. And then um, we can see also or we can observe a magnetic transition with the onset of about 10 Kelvin for from figure 3b. And um, this um, uh, long-range magnetic ordering is also confirmed by a peak from figure 3c at a temperature of 8.7 Kelvin, Kelvin, which we call the Neal uh, temperature. And then in addition, a divergence between the zero field cooled and the field cooled uh, measurements was observed below this um, Neal temperature from figure 3b, suggesting a canted AFM correlation. And then the magnetization in the um, isothermal uh, magnetization in figure 3d uh, rapidly increases to about 3 tesla and then linearly increases at um, 8 tesla. And this um, indicates that the cobalt two cobalt two interactions are predominantly AFM again, which is consistent with the negative Weiss constant. And then lastly, uh, we observed a mag magnetic hysteresis loop around um, this uh, range of uh, magnetic field. And this irre irreversible magnetization is consistent with a canted AFM ground state. And then um, to finally correlate the observed long-range magnetic ordering with the crystal structure, we evaluated qualitatively the nature of the magnetic exchange interactions associated with the neighboring cobalt centers in the stagome lattice. So um, the characterization measurements, we wanted to uh, correlate this with the crystal structure. So as illustrated in scheme one, there are four distinct uh, exchange parameters. We have JT1, JT2, and JT3 represented by the solid blue um, lines. And uh, these represent the inequivalent exchange parameters within the scalene triangle of the cobalt um, units. And um, the corresponding cobalt-cobalt distances are tabulated in table one, while in contrast, the JD uh, indicates the exchange parameter between the cobalt vertices of adjacent triangles separated by um, the distance of uh, around 3.22 angstroms as tabulated again in table one. So the stagome lattices are uh, well separated from each other because of a uh, an interlayer distance of around eight angstrom. So we uh, assume that the interlayer cobalt interactions are negligible. And then also based on the figure, the thick black lines represent the su uh, dominant super exchange pathways involving JT2, JT1, JT2, JT3, and JD. And according to a well-known rule in magnetism, the good enough Kanamori rule, um, whether the exchange interaction is ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic, it depends on the coordination geometry surrounding the metal centers. So it is well known in magnetism that um, uh, interactions or fer ferromagnetic interactions observed in several cobalt oxide phases with angles less than 100 degrees, while AFM interactions are observed with angles greater than 100 degrees. So from the table, uh, with angles um, uh, way uh, well above uh, 100 degrees, we see that JT1 and JT3 are considered antiferromagnetic interactions, while um, angles slightly below uh, 100 degrees, JT2 and JD are considered or as are expected as weak ferromagnetic interactions. But overall, the magnetic ordering is predicted to be AFM since AFM interactions dominate. And then consistent with the nature of the exchange interactions, this uh, scheme 2 
depicts our proposed spin arrangement of the cobalt-2 ions in the stagome lattice. So this paints a picture of long-range magnetic ordering with no spin frustration because we have successfully assigned the spins of the different cobalt ions. So in summary, the previously unknown stagome lattice has been discovered with the synthesis of a new layered cobalt-based compound. And this compound crystallizes in the monoclinic space group with its metal centers arranged in the distorted stagome lattice forming scalene triangles. And uh, magnetic and heat capacity measurements indicate that the cobalt-2-based compound possesses a canted AFM order below 8.7. Kelvin. And this study opens the door to the discovery of other new transition metal-based compounds featuring this stagome topology. So I would like to thank um, the ERDT program for my postdoctoral fellowship, as well as, of course, the uh, donors of the Robert Cheng Eurotex Professorial Chair for the opportunity to present this work today. Thank you all, and uh, I'm ready to answer questions if you have any. Thank you, for. All right, thank you, Ma'am Jem Valerie Perez. Unfortunately, Ma'am, uh, we have taken up the time for uh, the Q and A. Sorry, and po. Yeah, I can um, answer questions in the chat if you have. I will yes. stay until the end of the event, anyways. All right, thank you, po, Ma'am, and thank you, Sir uh, Carl. good luck to your research. Thank you. All right, our next presenter is Dr. Miguel Francisco Remolona. And his research is entitled Evaluation of Recurrent Neural Networks for Use in Structure-Based Drug Discovery. Dr. Miguel Romolona is a recipient of the Elzar Lorenzana Simon uh, DIEOR Golden Jubilee Professorial Chair in Artificial Intelligence. So if you are ready, Doc Mix, you can proceed. Uh, you can see my screen clearly? Yes. Uh, presentation. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So I am here to present a uh, work of one of my students in my laboratory, the evaluation of recurrent neural networks for use in structure-based drug discovery. Uh, so my name is Miguel Francisco Remolona, and I am the Elzar Lorenzana Simon, uh, the DIEOR, Golden Jubilee Professorial Chair in Artificial Intelligence. Um, anyway, so just to uh, start off, uh, I forgot to remove the animations here, but just to start off. So what we're trying to do is uh, try to apply machine learning methods in uh, drug discovery. So what I have here is a picture or an example of what typically happens in uh, normal drug discovery, or this is what they were doing before, before the advent of fast computers or faster uh, computers that can do molecular dynamics. So what they did was they um, uh, did high throughput sampling of a variety of uh, possible ligands or possible drug compounds and then applied them to the drugs either um, in vivo or in vitro, depending on how much funding that they have. But um, they tried this on an assay essentially first before they do it in, the, uh, in an animal. But they try it on an assay. So there's like tons of assays and then they uh, try different ligands for each cell and see which ones work. So this one is a very expensive method because you need to fabricate, you need to be able to synthesize all of those compounds that you are testing. And sometimes you're only going to use small doses of those uh, compounds. And then um, this costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. Typically, it takes about 10 to 15 research for a typical uh, small molecule drug. So a small molecule drug is... Uh, Drugs under, I think, 500, um, what do you call this? Uh, with a molecular weight less than 500. So what we want to do is we want to use other computational tools. So after traditional drug discovery, we have, um, come on, there, use structure-based drug discovery, which is what Professor uh, Gonzalez is uh, specializing in. And in fact, this work is a collaboration with him uh, when he, we essentially got a lot of our data from him. So what we did, uh, what he did was first um, he identifies a protein and then tries to identify where the binding site is or where the active site of that protein is so that we can try to see which ligands would bind to that site to prevent this uh, protein from being activated. So essentially the enzyme will no longer be able to function as intended because there is something blocking uh, that's active site. So they do this by performing docking simulations 
And after the docking, it will provide some sort of uh, uh, parameter, essentially some sort of binding energy, uh, some sort of descriptor for this binding energy to that uh, particular site. So what we wanted to do was use the data that he was generating because he was trying a lot of compounds on the initial, uh, initial study that we did last year. The, the number was around 1,533. And then he added a few more compounds this year. So uh, we're still retraining again. But essentially, in this study, we used the 1,533 um, molecules that he gave us. And we wanted to use machine learning or machine intelligence for that purpose. So uh, one way we found that should be able to help us do this is by the, through the use of Multivec. And later I'll show you what this Multivec does, but essentially a short um, description of what it is, is that if you have a particular molecule, you'll be able to generate vectors from these molecules. And these are vectors of continuous numbers, which is always helpful when you're trying to do computational learning. So we have vectors of, continu uh, we have vectors of continuous numbers, and these vectors uh, are around 300 in size, so 300 by one. So this is what Multivec does. So given a smile string, so I have some uh, examples here of some smile strings with four specific compounds, but given a particular smiles or a inline uh, representation of a molecule, for example, for glycine, this would be the inline uh, representation for that molecule. We don't write the H's anymore because they're implied. So every time you don't have a negative charge or every time you don't have uh, anything that balances out that molecules in terms of um, your number of bonds it needs to have, there's usually a hydrogen, a hydrogen uh, with that molecule. So here is the smiles representation for uh, glycine. So what happens now is for this glycine compound, uh, you look at each individual molecule and assign a particular identifier for each section. So you have an identifier with range zero, which is only identifying the molecule itself. And then you have one, uh, another identifier, which identifies uh, one distance away from your, um, from the molecule you are currently looking at. So it's essentially looking at the nitrogen carbon bond here. And then you also have something for the next molecule. So you have a carbon, and then you have all of the bonds to that carbon. Of course, you can extend this to further away. Um, in fact, in the paper by Jaeger in Multivec, what they did was they found that um, two was the optimal distance per, um, for uh, these types of studies, for types of studies involving molecules. You should, all, you should try to get identifiers for, with a uh, distance of two. However, for this study, we weren't able to find the embeddings that they had for a distance of two. And we are still generating that, uh, that library. So essentially the embeddings library, what would be the Morgan identifiers as well as the embeddings. And it will take a while because it takes a lot. Um, they used about 20 million compounds in generating those embeddings. So now that we have these, uh, essentially we have essentially ID this, um, molecule using the bonds or the ordering of the bonds as shown here, or we started with nitrogen, then carbon, then the next carbon, then the oxygen, this oxygen, the double bonded oxygen, and then the single bonded oxygen. So we started there and we have a representation now, but these things don't mean anything. They're just indexes for the Morgan identifiers of these structures. So now what we want to do is look at an embedding um, excuse me, an embedding array. So they have a library wherein all of these compounds or all of these identifiers are listed. Uh, well, not all of them. Some of the rare uh, identifiers were no longer included in the final, uh, well, most of the rare because a lot of them were rare. As you can see the numbers here reach up to like 4 billion. So there's four, around 4 billion identifiers that were, they were able to do. However, um, in the final embedding, there was only 21,000 
um, there were only 21,000 of these that remain. So what we do here is we search this library of the embeddings for what is the vector representation for that particular identifier. So essentially for each molecule, we're looking at, okay, what's the uh, ident unique identifier for this specific molecule? And then what's the unique identifier for all of the um, interactions it has with its neighbors? So that's what we have here. It's a 300 length array and I couldn't put everything here. So I've just shown a small uh, segment of all of the identifiers for glycine. And then what we do is we feed all of these numbers into a recurrent neural network. So for each, um, each 300, 300 lead vector would be fed as one data in a recurrent neural network. What happens in a recurrent neural network is that, okay, I process one side and then I process the one, the one next to it and then the one next to it using the results from the previous ones to influence my decision on, the next, uh, on my next prediction. So essentially what happens is that, okay, from this layer, if this is the first layer, I, am, I have a matrix here, which is a weight matrix, which I multiply to my... Uh, to my nodes to essentially get the next layer of nodes. Well, what happens is if I have a recurrent neural network, since this is the same weight mat matrix multiplied over and over again, I would have diminishing returns on the value of uh, the gradient for the first component. Essentially, this gradient decreases very, very rapidly as you have longer and longer chains. Uh, unfortunately, the, the length of our chains in our training data uh, reached about, I believe, 149. At least that was the maximum length that we have in our training data. Uh, I'm not sure if that includes for the 1,533. I believe that's only around, if I remember correctly, the length of our molecules there was only around um, 60. But then again, this 60 also includes the bonds. So you need to divide that by two. So around 30 molecules in length maximum. So instead of just using recurrent neural networks, we also tried um, the long short-term memory, which improves the accuracy of recurrent neural networks for longer uh, sequences. So for, the first se for our sequence, which reaches around, as I mentioned, 60 to about 150, um, LSTM would uh, perform better than just basic recurrent neural networks. So what we did was we tested this with the data provided by Dr. Gonzalez. So we tried molecular docking. Uh, we tried to um, simulate the results from molecular docking from Dr. Gonzalez for 1,530 ligands and their variants. And um, five binding scores were corresponding for each ligand. So we were able to get five scores for each molecule. And then non-binding results, because sometimes a molecule will not bind to a particular configuration of your ligand or will not bind at all, sorry, will not bind at all to your protein. So what happens there is we replace that value with an arbitrarily large value. So this would represent that it did not bind because we get we couldn't just put infinity because it would mess up the uh, calculation of the errors. And so what we did is we ran this on three different uh, models, a simple recurrent neural network, which was shown earlier, and then also the long short-term memory, and as well as a bidirectional uh, long short-term memory. So bidirectional LSTMs is just considering both directions when you're trying to compute for the um, for the final result that you want to push out. So these are some partial results for the RNNs. Um, I guess I didn't put this. I forgot the slide with regards to um, the configuration or the architecture of the final um, uh, neural networks. But these were the results for the RNNs, and usually we ran around five tests. Per, um, per type of, uh, essentially per, per type of model. So as you can see here, I think this is the results for the bidirectional LSTM. 
and it was the better performing of out of all wait this is not the bidirection i think this is just the simple rnn i'm sorry because it's less than 50% in all runs so this is the simple rnn and um, so we did five runs and it essentially performs around less than 50 around 48 to 49% accuracy and then we also have comparisons between RNNs and then the LSTM and the bidirectional LSTM. From what we have seen, at least in our five runs that we did, um, is that the LSTM and the bidirectional LSTM have similar, if not uh, the same performance. And that um, this is a in uh, promising initial result. Um, in terms of neural networks, 1,500 data points might not be um, a lot it might be uh, insufficient so we're trying out the new data that was given to us so we're going to move forward with that but i guess i'll go to that in the uh, next two slides so so our at least in our results we found that it there's a promise in trying to use these uh, machine learning models to predict these um, to predict the binding affinity for drug discovery Oh, yeah, so here. So there's a good chance that we get higher accuracy if we increase the data. And we also recognize that the relative scores are more important than the actual scores. So uh, as long as the ranking in the predictions correspond to the same rankings when you're looking at um, the actual uh, knocking scores, then uh, the neural network model would have performed um, equivalently, at least, to that uh, docking experiment. So uh, these are the things that, uh, yeah. So these were our findings. And then finally, moving forward, and what we are currently doing with uh, my project with another of my students is we are rerunning this with the additional binding data given by Dr. Gonzalez again uh, on six, a few thousand more ligands. So we have 16,000 additional chemicals. And then we're planning to incorporate ranking into the training algorithm so that um, it includes this ranking already when it tries to compute its loss instead of trying to fit a line which does not necessarily fit or not necessarily a line but a curve which that does not necessarily represent that uh, the idea for, um, for why docking is done. And then we wanted to recreate um, the multivec embedding with a depth of two instead of one. But of course, as I mentioned, this is going to be time consuming because of the amount of computational resources necessary. And then recreate the multivec embeddings using attention and transformers, which I have not discussed, but if you are familiar, uh, they were the more recent trends when it comes to uh, sequence training because they allow you to pay attention or they allow you to link um, what do you call this? Sequences that are not necessarily, uh, or they allow you to link, for example, in our case, two molecules, even if they were in the same, uh, beside each other in the SMILES representation. So I have a SMILES representation. So even if a molecule was, let's say, 10 uh, atoms away from what I am looking at, it will be able to relate uh, the properties of that molecule, perhaps if the molecule was bending, like if it was uh, in a C shape or something, and then there's interactions between this, mole uh, this molecule and one 15 molecules away, then it, it can still be able to detect and pay attention to that, to those values. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to use uh, attention and transformers. So that's about it. Um, I would like to thank uh, my undergraduate advisee for this preliminary work. And then of course, my uh, master's advisee, Alvin Benter, for uh, continuing this work and for the pro uh, promising results we have so far, I think. And then of course, Sir Al Elzar Simon for the generosity and the insights. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, um, Dr. Miguel Remolona. So unfortunately, uh, we don't have time for <laughs> Q&A at this point. <laughs> and, um, I think you can just reserve your questions or contact Dr. Miguel Remolona directly through the chat or through uh, his email as seen here in this slide. All right, thank you, Paul. Bye -bye. All right. Um
Sir Carl, na mute yata sarili niya. Oh, sorry. I, I mute myself. <laughs> Okay, so our next presenter is Dr. Joey Ocon, a recipient of the Federico E. Puno Professorial Chair for Energy for his research entitled Comparative Assessment of Solar Photovoltaic Wind Hybrid Energy Systems, a case for Philippine off-grid island. Okay, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Joey, take it away. Sir, nakamute din po yata kayo, sir? Okay, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks again, uh, Carl. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Pilario, uh, I'll be presenting um, a recent work that uh, we've done in our group on the comparative assessment of solar PV um, wind hybrid systems for um, Philippine off-grid islands operated by uh, Napa Horse Pag. I'd like to recognize the um, co-authors of this work. Um, the first author is uh, Mr. Jethro Pascasio, who is currently a PhD student at GIST in South Korea. Uh, also, um, Eugene Sparsha, who is uh, doing his PhD at KAIST, and uh, um, Mr. Michael uh, Castro. Um, we would like to acknowledge the uh, donors of the Federico Ipon uh, Puno Professorial Chair and also the funding from the Energy Research Fund of the UP Office of the Vice President for academic affairs. Um, they were instrumental in, in funding the um, completed electrified project of our group. Um, <clears throat> as uh, most of you know already, um, this work uh, was done under the Laboratory of Electrochemical Engineering and we are interested in um, doing energy storage uh, technology research at various scales, um, whether they are computational in nature, um, experimental or combination of, of those two approaches. Um, we Most of our works are still focused in uh, material science, chemistry level research, but uh, we have a second a subgroup who is also active in doing energy systems modeling, which will be subject of the subject of this presentation. Um, the, this particular work will focus on our, our recent solar wind uh, hybridization studies for large off-grid islands in the Philippines, but um, uh, we have been all we've been active also in studying on-grid systems such as this 100% uh, R transition paper uh, which was the subject of my PCA paper last year um, this um, rooftop uh, solar PV uh, paper uh, published last year in the journal energies um, outline of the presentation I will provide a short context on the situation of off-grid islands uh, we look at the objectives and the scope of the study um, which islands were, were studied. Um, I will discuss the methodology uh, that we've employed and the results and discussions and the insights that we can draw from the results of this paper. If you're interested in uh, reading the full paper, I invite you to download the paper uh, using this um, QR code. Um, it's available in Elsevier's uh, Journal of Renewable Energy. Um, currently, most of our big off-grid islands in the Philippines that are operated under the Napocor uh, Small Power Utility Group. They're powered mostly by um, diesel power plants. Um, the issue of, of use, utilizing diesel, of course, is that aside from it's noisy, it's um, uh, polluting, polluting uh, nature because of the high CO2 emissions. The cost of electricity is also high. <clears throat> Typical crew cost for generation utilizing diesel is around 20 to even 100 pesos per kilowatt hour. The off-grid residents in the big uh, islands in the Philippines, uh, the rates that they're paying are subsidized. And the subsidy comes from the universal uh, cost for additional electrification, which is a uh, tariff levied to us, um, electricity, electricity consumers, in our uh, monthly bills. Um, back in 2016, a group from Germany performed the Global Hybridization Study, which was published in the journal Energy Policy. Um, I had a brief uh, stay as a visiting scientist at uh, the Institute of uh, Dr. Philip Leshinger, and uh, following their study, we decided to focus on the Philippines. So this was the subject of my 2019 uh, PCA paper, uh, extending their work to focus on NPC Spag Islands uh, for more than 100 islands in the Philippines. And we found that 
um, just uh, utilizing alone uh, solar PV in combination with existing uh, diesel facilities and adding uh, energy storage such as a battery energy storage system will reduce the true cost by around 20%. It will allow um, the operation to save around 2 billion US dollars from um, importing uh, a lot of diesel and also avoiding uh, a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. However, uh, as with uh, most uh, greenfield and brownfield projects, uh, this will require an investment of around uh, 20 billion uh, pesos. Uh, following that work, um, another uh, collaboration between another German institution, um, we uh, used cluster analysis to analyze uh, more than 500 of the islands in the Philippines, and we found uh, some interesting clusters. We have certain clusters where you have a high solar resource or some areas where you have high wind resource but low um, solar resource, and we, we offer um, possible technology combinations on how to address off-grid electrification in these areas. Uh, last year, uh, we, ex we extended our work not just to cover off-grid islands, but also um, energy transition in the main grid in the Philippines. Um, this was the first um, clean energy transition study um, with a high uh, spatial temporal resolution, early modeling for uh, the transition from 2015 um, to 2015 in the Philippines. And we, we um, recently published this work in RCR. And, uh, we showed in the paper the different technologies which would be crucial when you want to deeply decarbonize our, our energy system. Um, on top of, of looking at solar and wind, um, we uh, have considered also the use of um, waste uh, biomass to displace uh, most of the diesel fuel that are being used in the grid islands. And in, a, in this uh, work before, we found that uh, it's, it's uh, possible to displace up to 10% of diesel fuel diesel um, fuel if you consider um, waste by mass gasification coupled with your uh, existing diesel power plant units. Now, the objective of this work is to perform the first uh, nationwide assessment of the techno-economic potential of uh, solar PV and wind hybridization in the current NPC spag uh, operated islands. So this is more than, um, more than 140 uh, grids which are uh, being supplied mostly by diesel PPPs. Uh, specifically, we want to identify the different cost optimal architectures. In, in off-grid electrification, at least cost approach is the, most, um, is the one that makes the most sense. We want to compare different configurations and det determine the effects of uh, the resource availability from your, your, your solar and wind resource to the optimal uh, levelized cost uh, based hybrid system and the maximum RE shares that you can tap from, from those microgrids. Uh, we want to examine also sensitivities of the HRES or the hybrid renewable energy systems to, diff to the uh, changing uh, prices of the technologies, okay? the, the decreasing cost of solar, cost of storage, um, wind turbines, and even the increase in the load as you connect more uh, consumers and as you supply 24-7 electricity in, in the islands. I want to evaluate the potential benefits of, of the hybridization at the national, uh, at the national scale to, um, <clears throat> to suggest uh, improvements in our current um, policy. So in this work, we studied 140 existing off-grid islands with a total diesel capacity of around 405 megawatt peak. Um, these off-grid islands, as you can see here, um, you can also see the size of the, their existing diesel capacities, ranging from a few kilowatts to even um, ten, uh, tens of, of megawatts. So you have large off-grid islands like uh, Mindoron, um, Marinduque, Palawan, uh, the Sulu Archipelago um, provinces. And there's a table here showing the distribution of the microgrid studied, okay, and the uh, specific uh, island groups. Uh, the general methodology, uh, this is quite common for um, techno-economic studies. We prepare the techno-economic data uh, wherein you um, research on the current cost of the technologies, the weighted average cost of capital. You combine that with your consumption profile. So you have um, actual load profile from Napocor on the different islands, but there are uh, simulated or synthetic uh, load profiles for islands where we don't have the data. We use a software called Homer Pro um, to calculate the optimal um, hybrid configuration, and then we analyze the results at a nationwide level. 
So for the RAV source data, we use the uh, field LiDAR to um, glo global horizontal irradiance data for solar and the wind power density at 80 meters data sets from field LiDAR also. Uh, these were processed by one of our uh, staff using QGIS and we use the process data to as input in our energy systems models. As mentioned earlier, um, there are typical load profiles for these islands. You have this characteristic uh, peak during June, um, during the summer months because of uh, large um, cooling requirements. You have also this peak in the evening where most of your uh, household activities are, are being done in, in, the, in the houses of, of the residents. Um, the uh, areas with the, we, where we don't have the load uh, data, we, we assume the peak as half of the diesel capacity, which is uh, typically true for off-grid areas um, in any parts of the world. So the hybrid system uh, model was employed um, using uh, Homer Pro software. It's a proprietary software um, developed by NREL, but is currently uh, um, part of uh, the UL um, group. Um, the optimization algorithm follows the load following strategy where only excess resource from RE uh, are used to charge your energy storage um, system. Um, the, the model will consider different configurations and it will provide you with uh, um, optimal configurations based on the lowest levelized cost of electricity. So these are the techno-economic parameters which were uh, used in, in the study. Um, there, were, um, or there were existing diesel generators for most of the islands, so there is no uh, capex requirement at year zero. Uh, but of course, you have to buy um, solar PV, your, your storage, your wind turbines at year zero, including their uh, replacement um, costs. And using these techno-economic parameters and an early uh, simulation and optimization in the engine, it will provide you with the uh, um, cost optimal hybrid configurations, including their um, renewable energy shares, the different sizes of the components, um, and also the, the power flows. Now to add the depth to our analysis, uh, we explored um, diff the, the different uh, prices for the um, new technologies or, or new components to be installed in the hybrid system, such as your diesel, uh, the, the, the battery, the solar PV, the wind, and also the demand. Um, we, we studied lower values, higher values relative to the um, current values that are um, found in, in these islands. Now let's go to the results. Uh, this is a sample hybridization study for the Kalayan Island. Um, out of the 140, 140 plus microgrids, we found that uh, Kalayan Island has the lowest uh, levelized cost of electricity. And uh, the reason behind that is that it has one of the highest wind power density also in, in the island studied. Um, in fact, the cost optimal hybrid system uh, will not use solar PV. Okay? And if you get the renewable energy fraction for the operation for an entire year, it's around 84%, uh, which is a fairly high um, RE share. Of course, the, the status quo is 0% uh, RE because uh, Kalayan Island is just powered by a uh, diesel power plant at the moment. Um, another sample hybridization study is the one for Higatangan Island, which has the highest uh, RE share, around 92%. Um, it has a good complementarity of wind um, and, and solar, uh, wherein you have a high resource, high availability for one of these RE um, component when the other is uh, not available. So this uh, allows uh, displacing a lot of the, the diesel that is used to power this um, island. So performing the um, simulation and optimization for the 147 off-grid area, uh, off areas, we now have the uh, summarized results. And as you can see here, you have in, in the left, in the first column, you have the different configurations like your cost optimal configuration, your diesel only case, the case where you have uh, solar PV and diesel, wind diesel, solar PV, wind diesel, and other configurations. The last, um, the last row pertains to a 100% uh, RE system, which is possible in a microgrid. However, that 100% uh, uh, renewable energy system will, um, will 
significantly increase the levelized cost. And as you can see here, the optimal uh, for the national uh, the national level, the optimal scenario will reduce the um, LCOE to around uh, 0.22 US dollars per kilowatt, which is a uh, uh, really good uh, reduction already in, in terms of the true cost generation. But if you operate a 100% R system, the um, levelized cost would be around 50 pesos per kilowatt hour, which is way, way higher than the residents are paying. Currently, the residents of our upgrade areas are paying a subsidized, um, subsidized rate of around five to uh, six pesos per, per kilowatt hour. So the, the use of both uh, solar and, and wind will allow a higher RA penetration than if you use solar PV alone. Um, to be able to um, have this uh, significant LCA reduction um, of, uh, which corresponds to an RE share of around 58%, um, you need a capex of uh, around 928 uh, million US dollars in contrast to the full RE system, which is around 10 times higher. Now, if you look at the optimal component sizes, so um, it, it really depends on the location of the island. It depends on the load profile and the uh, available resources. So some islands have an optimal cost optimal scenario where it will only utilize um, wind, PV, and diesel. Some islands will um, use, uh, most of the islands will use uh, wind. Okay? Um, However, in, in, in the, the model, um, it, it's still difficult to have a low cost system wherein you don't operate with diesel generators because you need the diesel generators as backup or as um, your, your frequency uh, reserve to make sure that the system operates um, in a stable uh, configuration. If you look at the energy mix for the 140 plus islands, you can see here you have a national level, um, you have your, your diesel, your kilowatt average um, configuration at the, nation, at the national level is around 34% uh, diesel, 23% um, solar, and around 40% uh, wind. There are certain areas of the country where you have high wind resource, and as you can see here, they, are, they have a higher uh, share of, of energy consumed from the operation of, of wind power plants, whereas some areas like the Sulu Archipelago and Davao, they have uh, limited uh, wind resource. So if you want to hybridize, uh, you're, you're mostly limited to utilizing uh, solar PV instead of both uh, solar PV and, and wind. Um, in, in some areas, diesel power is still preferred over solar PV because of the flexible generation schedule. Uh, and you already have your existing uh, diesel power plants at and you don't require to purchase, uh, you're not required to purchase additional capacity. Um, looking at the possible, um, uh, this is a sensitivity analysis for um, cost of technology. And as you can see in from, from this figure, your, your y axis is the LCOE, the x axis is the possible change in the capex of the various technologies involved, and um, the advantage of having, um, having um, HFS systems or RE-based um, um, hybridized system, it's, it's, more, it's less prone to the um, changes in the fuel cost. And the cost of, of diesel is uh, fluctuating. Uh, sometimes it's goes, uh, it, it goes down, but uh, most of the time it, it goes up. And especially if you have to transport diesel from mainland to, to island, it, it uh, adds to the cost of, of the fuel. And you can see here you have uh, lesser sensitive um, HVS systems and the scenario where in it uh, makes sense to retain the diesel only case is in, only if you have a significant reduction in the price of, of diesel. Um, another um, sensitivity analysis that we performed is what if the energy consumption in the islands increase? What will be the impact on the sizing of the um, different components of the microgrid and then also the LCOE. And then from the results of the study, we found that um, when energy demand exceeds twice the current demand, uh, you, you can have uh, high electricity cost, okay? Um, uh, but uh, also 
it will um, it uh, it can still be supplied by the existing uh, by the um, optimal hybrid systems that were considered before the increase of, of the load. Um, there are some areas wherein uh, wind uh, power can become more feasible. Okay, and in in the previous case where the load is just the uh, current uh, load demand for third islands from the data from NPC. Wind is, is uh, not yet a uh, cost optimal component in the um, picture. Uh, policy implications uh, it's important to connect uh, this study on the requirements for UCME. Uh, we are projected to contribute around uh, 20 billion. Um, universal cost for emission electrification by year 2021. Uh, this 20 billion will be used to pay the generation of electricity utilize, using the existing diesel power plants. So if you can uh, hybridize these 147 microgrids, it will reduce the operating cost. And uh, by, by around, um, third, by around uh, 25, 25%. So you can really compute the possible savings from UCMA requirements. Now, uh, what's the what's the implication on that uh, reduction? Um, it, it's possible that we can, if you can find the capital to hybridize, our electricity bill will be reduced because uh, we, we will have a smaller UCMA requirement from all uh, electricity users in the country. At the same time, um, you can provide 24 seven because not all of these islands are being provided electricity um, for the whole um, day um, with a system that, uh, that generates less uh, CO2 emissions. So uh, to conclude um, this study, we were able to prove that um, it, it makes sense to hybridize, not just using solar, but also wind. It will uh, diversify, diversify the energy mix, at the same time, reduce further the cost of electricity and uh, displays a uh, higher fraction of, of diesel fuel. Uh, so follow-up work, we have extended this uh, particular study, not just to the currently, uh, to the islands currently operated by NPC SPAG, but to more than 600 plus islands. This is the subject of a new paper, which will most likely be the subject of my PCA talk uh, next year. And aside from that, we've uh, uh, studied also the recently, uh, the list uh, recently released by the Department of Energy for the waived areas in, in Palawan and in the Visayas region. Um, they are offering these sites as a possible uh, qualified third party sites and we want to analyze the financial sustainability of uh, um, putting up hybrid renewable energy systems in these islands and uh, this will guide um, the private sector in improving their participation in off grid electrification. Um, these off-grid uh, off research activities in the lab, we really want to show that it's possible to decrease subsidies if you hybridize, but you need to have access to capital. Uh, we're working with the private sector players to um, use, for, for them to use our results and uh, models to identify islands where it's already, uh, it already makes sense to enter and uh, um, propose um, microgrid projects based on our systems, and hopefully this could improve the lives of of good residents in, in the country. So this is um, another initiative of our group, the off grid PH. We are consolidating all our off grid research into this website. Um, you can check the website, and uh, uh, some of the uh, results of this paper are already uh, visualized in the portal. So thank you for listening, and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, Dr. Joey Ocon. Uh, yes, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. So I guess if you have the contact or email address of Dr. Joey, then you can ask him the questions directly. Thank you, Paul. All right, so we now have our next presenter. Uh, Marlon Mopon Jr., who is a recipient of the Cesar Buenaventura Professorial Chair. His research is entitled Corrosion Behavior of AA um, 1100 Anodized in Gallic Sulfuric Acid Solution. 
So do we have Marlon here with us? Uh, Ready? Hello, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, can you All see right. my slides? Yes. Okay, loud and okay. clear. Proceed. Thank so um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Marlon L. Malpin, Jr. And I am here to present uh, our recent work entitled Corrosion Behavior of uh, AA1100 Anodized and Gallic Sulfuric Acid Solution. So before I start, I would like to thank the donors of the Cesar Buenaventura Professorial Chair for giving me the opportunity to present this particular work. So uh, as an introduction to this work, so corrosion is actually a problem that uh, persists today. It is an inevitable process and it's something that we encounter in everyday life, whether um, in transportation or in the structures that uh, we have in our society. Now, the global cost of corrosion in 2013 was estimated to be around 3.4% of the global GDP, which is around 2.5 billion US dollars. Now, since this data was from 2013, it is expected that the value um, is much higher for, um, for 2021. Okay, now since corrosion is inevitable, so we cannot uh, completely stop it or stopping it uh, or um, preventing it completely is not practical. So the idea is to use corrosion protection in order to prolong the service life of our metallic materials. Okay, so in the past, the typical um, treatment use in order to uh, provide active and passive corrosion protection to metals, or one of the treatments available is the use of cro uh, chromate conversion coating. So in chromate conversion, so um, hexavalent chromium is used in order to produce um, an insoluble oxide layer in the surface of the metal. So this um, oxide layer provides passive corrosion protection in the form of a, a barrier layer, which prevents the exposure of the metallic substrate to the um, aggressive corroding substances. Uh, additionally, the chromate conversion coating also provides active corrosion protection in the sense that hexavalent chromium can be um, incorporated in the uh, oxide layer that is formed. And whenever there is a defect in that oxide layer, the hexavalent chromium can get released and then it can interact with the defect and then seal it and prevent it from progressing. So uh, for the longest time, this was the industry standard for um, providing uh, corrosion protection to materials or to metals. However, it was um, uh, th there was a particular concern and the use of hexavalent chromium, particularly because it is carcinogenic. Hence, there was um, um, a drive to look for alternative treatment procedures that can provide corrosion protection, but at the same time avoid the carcinogenic nature of chromate uh, conversion coatings. So in the case of aluminum, so aluminum is one of the metals that is commonly used in uh, industries today. It is particularly used in the aviation industry because of its um, high strength and uh, low uh, lightweight. So in order to uh, provide corrosion protection to aluminum, so here are some of the common methods or techniques that are employed. So we have anodization treatment, plasma electrolytic oxidation, and the use of coatings and uh, corrosion inhibitors. So the first three, uh, anodization, plasma electrolytic oxidation and coating. So basically these provide passive protection in the sense that it forms a barrier layer that minimizes the exposure of the metal to our corroding species. Now, corrosion inhibitors, on the other hand, are basically chemicals which can be incorporated into the uh, barrier layer in, or into the protective layer so that it can respond to damage or defects in the coating or in the uh, oxide layer. Uh, when there is a defect, so the corrosion inhibitors can get released and then they can interact with the metal so that uh, the metal will, uh, will not get corroded even further. Okay, so systems used to protect aluminum usually incorporate um, this techniques in combination with each other. So you can combine um, anodization and plasma electrolytic oxidation with the use of coatings. And then uh, current studies actually explore the integration of corrosion inhibitors into the coatings or into the oxide layer in order to approximate the performance uh, previously provided by chromate conversion coatings. 
unfortunately, uh, COVID conversion putting still offer the best performance out there, uh, but um, continuous research on this uh, field um, is hoped to uh, eventually reach um, to uh, reach a method that can provide uh, comparable performance. Now for this work, we are actually focusing on the anodization process. So in anodization or uh, in aluminum anodization, so basically you have a metal and then you oxidize or you anodize that metal. So the anodization process basically converts um, the outer layer of the aluminum metal uh, into an aluminum oxide layer. Okay, so this can be driven by the application of a current or potential into the system. So it can be uh, potential statically controlled or galvanic statically controlled. And at the same time, the electrolyte that is used can be modified in order to um, achieve particular properties. For example, if you want high friction resistance, you, you can, um, you can uh, tune your electrolyte to achieve that. Uh, if you want to uh, modify the structure, microstructure, you can also modify your electrolyte. So the typical um, electrolyte for um, aluminum anodization is uric acid. However, it can be combined with weak acids again and other, ad uh, other additives in order to uh, achieve particular properties. So for this work, we actually focused on the, uh, we wanted to explore the use of the sulfuric acid, gallic acid um, mixed electrolyte. So we selected gallic acid because it was reported to have corrosion inhibition properties. And uh, we were wondering if we can integrate this into the um, anodization electrolyte. And we want to check if it can improve the uh, resulting oxide layer that was formed. And then there are also reports that it is used as an additive in sulf sulfuric organic acid electrolytes. However, there is limited, uh, there is no literature showing um, how it performs when it is the main organic acid added to the sulfuric acid electrolyte. So the objective of this work is as follows. We wanted to explore the effect of the gallic sulfuric acid anodization electrolyte and the corrosion behavior of AA1100. So uh, specifically, you wanted to determine the effect of different concentrations, of gallic acid and uh, concentrations of gallic acid and anodization current density on the corrosion resistance of the sealed anodized AA1100. And then uh, we wanted, we observed the evolution of the corrosion behavior of the sealed anodized AA1100 samples using EIS and uh, linear polarization. So for the methodology, so uh, for the anodization part, so we have three major steps. We have the pretreatment, the anodization, and the hot water sealing. So for the pretreatment, we implemented this. So we have degreasing followed by etching and then electropolishing. And then um, the pretreated samples were anodized in two electrode cells. So we have um, basically a beaker and then we have uh, our working electrode, the pre electrode, the pretreated uh, aluminum uh, metal, and then a counter electrode, in this case, another uh, aluminum sheet with a larger surface, surface area. And then the power source um, is, uh, we have an external power source that will provide constant current for the anodization process. So the anodization ran for 45 minutes. And then here on the table on the lower left side shows the uh, combination of gallic acid concentration and anodization current density that we used. Uh, after anodization, we used hot water sealing to seal the sample. So for hot water sealing, basically it closes the pores that is formed during the anodization process. So all of the samples were sealed for 20 minutes uh, in boiling water. So for the characterizations, we use SEM to observe what kind of uh, uh, to observe the uh, layers that we formed after anodiz uh, after anodization and sealing, and then afterwards we um, submerge or we immerse the samples in 3.5 weight percent sodium chloride, and then observe them using EIS and linear polarization over a 20 day period. So for the results, so SE, uh, in terms of the SEM, so here are the uh, layers that we, ob that we obtained. So these are the sealed oxide layers that we obtained during the process. So uh, we have here the 5CD, 5GA, so that's 5 milliampers per cm squared uh, current density and 5% uh, percent gallic acid. So 10CD, GA, 15CD, 5GA, 10CD, 0GA, and 10CD, 0. Um, this is, um, I think, 
Okay, so this uh, one is 10 CD, five, um, yeah, that's CD, uh, 15 CD, 10, uh, 10 GA. Okay, so for the apparent uh, thickness trend, so we have, um, we observe the following. So in terms of the effect of the current density, so the higher current density, the higher the current anodization current density, so the thicker the layer. So this is consistent with the um, reported behavior in the literature since that you, ha you have more current, so you have um, higher capacity to convert the aluminum to aluminum oxide. And then in terms of the effect of the uh, gallic acid concentrations, we observe that um, higher gallic acid amounts resulted to thinner layer, which uh, suggests that um, higher amounts of gallic acid can um, increase the dissolution rate of the oxide layer. Uh, now for the corrosion uh, behavior, so here are the EIS um, body, uh, in, uh, body, in, uh, body phase and body impedance plots that we have. So if we look at the lower impedance uh, lower the value of the impedance at the low frequency or at the 10 to the negative 2 uh, 10 millihertz uh, frequency. So you can see here that um, the performance of the um, sample anodized in 5 milliampere per cm squared and 5 um, five grams per liter of uh, gallic acid actually performs comparable with the blank or with the, uh, with the sample um, anodized in 10 milliampere per cm squared and 5 uh, 10 milliampere per cm squared and uh, 0 grams per liter of gallic acid. So um, as we prog uh, proceeded with the uh, immersions, we observed that um, the sample 5CD5GA actually has the highest um, uh, low frequency impedance throughout the immersion. So uh, after 20 days of immersion, so we observed that, uh, again, the 5CD5GA shows the highest low frequency impedance, which is an interesting behavior since um, the barrier layer thick the oxide layer thickness obtained for this sample is quite low compared to the other values. So this behavior is potentially due to the uh, compactness of the layer that we obtained. So suggesting that at low amounts, the gallic acid might result to a more uh, compact, but at the same time, more dense um, uh, oxide layer, which can provide um, better corrosion protection. Now uh, we fitted the uh, EIS data with this equivalent circuit for uh, easier comparison. So if we look at the porous layer resistance, so the porous layer resistance uh, for the uh, 10CD0GA and 5CD5GA are comparable. But if we look at the barrier layer resistance, so the 10CD, 10GA, um, performs, um, uh, the 5CD5GA performs better than the 10CD. Than GA, while the rest of the samples performed at a much lower, um, uh, the corrosion resistance of the other samples are much lower. Now, uh, we also use linear polarization in order to check if the, the uh, in order to supplement the data that we have from EIS and from the um, linear polarization results, we observe that the um, 5 CD. 5GA sample actually has the lowest um, corrosion current, which is consistent with the observations that we have for the um, EIS. So the interesting uh, uh, part here is that, uh, again, 5CD, 5GA was produced at a lower current density. So if uh, we can attain um, better corrosion performance at a lower current density, so that might be something that is worth exploring since that can improve the um, cost of the anodization process since we need we would need to consume less power compared to the ones produced at uh, higher current densities. So for the summary, so again, the corrosion behavior of AA 1100 samples and bison gallic sulfuric acid bats were explored, was explored, and then uh, high anodization current densities and high gallic acid concentrations was observed to lead to lower corrosion resistances. However, um, at low GA concentration and low current density, 
um, we observe that this can lead to superior corrosion resistances relative to the samples anodized in sulfuric uh, acid alone. So we think that this is, is something that we can explore further. So for future work, we hope to do compositional and microstructure studies of the oxide layer, as well as in-situ observation of the oxide layer degradation in order to figure out um, what exactly causes the behavior that we observe. So with that, thank you very much for your time. And if you have questions, um, you can reach out to me via the chat or via email. Thank you again. All right, thank you, Sir Marlon Mopon. I think we have uh, time to accommodate just one question from the audience. Are there anyone who would like to ask a question? I can, I have a question. Uh, okay, Marlon. sir. Mm. Uh, so uh, you mentioned earlier that you wanted to see in situ the way how uh, it degrades. Um, are you also planning to look at looking in situ the way how the oxide layer is forming? Um, oh, sir. Yes, sir. So that is actually one uh, interesting thing that we want to look at. So for in situ <laughs> observation. Uh, 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 hello. Um, yes, yes. So yeah. So yeah, we want to uh, observe that as well. So the formation and the degradation, uh, and we expect that I think for this part, uh, the, the formation part though might be a little more challenging to observe in situ since the um, reaction conditions is much more vigorous compared to the uh, degradation uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to slow it down if ever, um, so that you can do it in situ? For the in situ, sir, uh, we are uh, at least we are considering uh, optical observation of the I surface. See. So um, for the uh, formation part, it might be challenging since uh, it, the process again is inherently vigorous. Uh, but for the degradation part, I think optical observation of the surface as it degrades is um, easier since um, the uh, solution that we use or the system that we use for observing the. Uh, degradation is uh, much more steep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marlon. All right, thank you very much for that question. And uh, thank you, Marlon, for your presentation. Thank you, Rinpo. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Rizalinda De Leon. She is the Apollonia and Lorna Eason Professorial Chair in Chemical Engineering recipient. And her research is entitled Rationalizing the regulatory requirements of the Philippine downstream natural gas industry. So without further ado, ma'am, you can proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see already my screen. Uh, still loading, ma'am. Uh, still loading. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, there it is, I guess. All right, yes. All right, so hi everyone. Uh, my professorial chair lecture this year delves into regulatory policy that affects the downstream natural gas industry in the Philippines. Um, I would like to recognize and thank the donors of my professorial chair, Paul and Lorna Eason, who are joining us uh, the, today from Los Angeles. Uh, thank you for staying up late, way beyond your bedtime there. So thank you. And uh, so, so why is this study relevant today? We all know the amazing story of the Malampaya deep, gas, deep water gas to power project. It started when the Malampaya gas field was discovered by uh, SPEX, Shell Philippines Exploration in 1992. Then the offshore facility and the 504 kilometer undersea pipeline was inaugurated in 2001 and went into full operation in 2002. Producing trillions of, um, of uh, standard cubic feet of natural gas, it provides fuel to four gas-fired power plants, generating nearly 30% of the Luzon grid. However, that story is about to come to end. So in the interest of energy security and to avoid a repeat of the debilitating rotating brownouts that crippled economic activity back in the late 1980s to the early 1990s, and with no alternative feasible indigenous natural gas reserves ready for exploitation right now, the Philippines is poised to import liquefied natural gas for the first time. 
In preparation for this, the Philippine Department of Energy issued Department Circular 2017-1112, otherwise known as the Philippine Downstream Natural Gas Regulation or PDNGR. For context, natural gas is extracted from the gas fields. In the case of Malampaya, it is extracted from an offshore subsea gas field. Upon extraction, the natural gas is processed to remove impurities such as sulfur and mercury compounds and remove condensates to prevent downstream corrosion and other risks. For long distance transport by sea or, or uh, by road, okay, uh, natural gas is first liquefied um, and transported in special ships called LNG carriers, shown here, which are equipped with cryogenic storage tanks. The ships then unload the LNG into receiving facilities, which could either be onshore or offshore. In the receiving facility, also known as the import terminal, the LNG is stored in specially constructed tanks meant to maintain cryogenic conditions. Prior to distribution, the liquid natural gas is pumped to the desired export pressures and then heated to convert it to gaseous form and, uh, and to be distributed via either via pipeline to end users or uh, by other means. Okay? Cryogenic trucks and ships may also be used to transport where a pipeline is unavailable. The envisioned uh, Philippine natural gas industry covers only the activities enclosed in the red box here, namely transport, receiving, gasification, regasification, metering, and distribution, and end use. To date, there are already a number of LNG projects approved in the, and in the pipeline. Okay, so listed here are just some properties of LNG. So it's stored at a um, cryogenic. Uh, conditions stored and transported under cry cryogenic conditions as shown. It seems safe, right? So it's color clear, colorless, odorless, non-corrosive, non-toxic, right? However, once it leaks out, it instantly volatilizes, heats up, mixes with air, and can easily ignite. In a confined environment, natural gas is explosive. Now that sounds really dangerous. However, since the industry's inception in 1959, there have been no record of fatalities, loss of cargo containment or major accidents or safety problems in port or on the high seas. Now this excellent safety record is due to the industry's adherence to multi-layer protection requirements, which include primary and secondary containment, safeguard systems, separation distances, plus a broad set of standards, codes, and regulations. The PDNGR mandates a number of government agencies to form the Philippine Interagency Health Safety, Security, and Environment Monitoring and Inspection Team, or PIAHSSE, IMT, which is tasked to ensure the health and safety of the industry workers and the public and ensure the industry's uh, security and minimize any environmental risks that the industry may pose. The project is meant to continue um, technical assistance to the DOE on the implementation of the PDNGR. There are a number of agencies uh, involved, including the DENR, DILG, uh, particularly the Bureau of Fire, DOLE, uh, and the DOTR, as well as the concerned local government units. The general project objective is shown to identify and overlaps as well as possible um, sources of inefficiencies and confusion in the technical and HSE related regulatory requirements and processes of agencies and LGUs relevant to the regulation of the downstream natural gas industry and to provide some recommendations to rationalize these. The study covers the middle portion of the natural gas value chain uh, indicated by the dashed line here, starting from transport receiving, followed by regasification, then transmission distribution, uh, particularly the virtual pipeline. As mentioned, our scope was made consistent with the scope of the PDNGR and therefore included regulations relevant to onshore import terminals, um, floating storage and regas regasification units or FSRUs, floating storage units or FSUs, LNG trucks and LNG ships. 
the methodology we used is shown in this flowchart, okay? And um, we mainly um, st started with literature review of the global LNG regulations and applicable engineering standards and codes. Then we gathered data and information, particularly the regulatory requirements and processes of the different agencies that we, have, we had identified to be relevant to the downstream natural gas industry. This included the eight to nine agencies mentioned in the PDNGR, four members of the PIAHSSEMIT, plus more, okay? So we, we, uh, we actually uh, involved many more agencies, okay? We then proceeded to generate a regulatory map and identify the following preliminary issues, okay? So any gaps about the global LNG regulations and applicable engineering codes and standards, and some possible issues with the ease of doing business law and its uh, IRR and the PDNGR, okay? So we also analyzed the regulatory processes, okay? of the different agencies to reveal bottlenecks uh, and overlaps, if there are any. We tried to validate our findings with their, uh, their respective offices. I must mention that because all these activities were being done during the pandemic lockdowns, our validation had been limited because of many, many government offices were operating at lower capacity at that time, and therefore had to uh, prioritize their critical functions, which does not include answering surveys or doing key informant interviews. But we, uh, we were able to do some of those as well, okay? A regulatory impact analysis then was carried out using a qualitative cost, sorry about that, a qualitative cost uh, and benefit analysis. And the PRINCE method as well. The PRINCE method is meant to assess likelihood of adoption and implementation of our proposed regulatory reforms. Lastly, we presented our findings to the Department of Energy and in a public consultation to gather further comments. Okay. Now, um, just to give you a glimpse of our findings, the, here is a summary of the recommendations to one of the agencies, the Maritime Industry Authority or MARINA. There are two types of regulatory proposals that we, uh, we came up with. One is the reform type, okay, which merely proposes the streamlining and clarifying uh, of existing regulatory processes. And the second one is an alternative uh, regulation, which proposes the adoption of global standards and best practices that are currently not yet included in existing regulatory policy. In this sample slide table, we see both reform and alternative proposals. The proposed regulatory reform here is to reduce documentary requirements, which is expected to ease uh, the, the way we do business, right? Uh, ma mainly to reduce or to, e to ease the compliance with the Anti-Red Tape Act. And then there's one alternative proposal here, uh, which is to integrate uh, LNG cryogenic standards into local standards, specifying uh, 33 CFR 127 and NFPA 30. Uh, so if this proposal is adopted by the agency, um, it can improve the safety, efficiency, productivity of the facility. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are 27 sli such slides for specific agencies and LGUs. We have indicated the global codes and standards that need to be adopted by each agency, all right? So this is just a summary of all of those, okay? So in total, we have covered 57 global codes, standards, and guidelines, 25 government agencies and LGUs, 27 uh, slides of detailed recommendations for specific agencies and LGUs. And in conclusion, we were able to identify three overarching recommendations. The first recommends global codes and standards that need to be adopted, integrated, and localized. The second proposes the need to rationalize intra and inter-agency regulations and processes. 
in order to reduce, clarify, and streamline regulatory processes as well as to clarify jurisdictions were needed because there were, there were, there were some instances wherein there seemed to be uh, conflicts in jurisdiction among agencies. And the third is uh, recommends the de development and provision of harmonized checklists, report templates, guides, information, and to simplify the application submission and review process, particularly by, um, by getting, uh, getting the submission process integrated into the EVOSS of the DOE. Okay. So this project was funded by the Energy Research Fund of the University of the Philippines, Office of Vice President for Academic Affairs, and implemented by the Department of Chemical Engineering. Okay, uh, I would like to um, just uh, recognize the project team. Uh, that's engineer Carmelita Villanueva and engineer uh, associate prof, assistant professor Christian Julayap of the chemical engineering department, professor Olpiano Ignacio Jr. of the Institute of Civil Engineering, Dr. Alan Nervis of the Electrical and Electronics Institute, uh, and uh, Dr. Joseph Gerard Reyes. So this, uh, this project is actually a multidisciplinary project. And of course, lastly, I would like to thank the generous donors of the Apollonio and Lorna Eason Professorial Chair in Chemical Engineering, Engineers Paul and Lorna Eason. Both of them are alumni of the UP College of Engineering. Lorna finished BSCHE, while Paul BSME. So many, many thanks. And uh, that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation, Ma'am Bipilin. As uh, so of this point, let's uh, entertain a few questions from the audience. Okay, so uh, Goran raised his hand. Go ahead. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, thanks. Thank hi, you Goran. for the presentation. Uh, I'm open ended in question, and it's, regard, it's with regards to your research flow process. Yeah. Um, no, meron po kayo na finalized the regulatory reforms or alternatives. Uh, yeah. Are all of those po like did all like did all of the parties na nakausap niyo po or na nakapag consult po na uh, kinonsult niyo po? Uh, did they agree ba po to the final list or were there some proposals na hindi po what like hindi, they don't agree with? Tapos if uh, so, ano yeah. po na handle yung mga ganong kinds of cases? Thank you, thank you, Goran. Actually, the we only presented them, and there were some uh, clarifications given to us. So that was part of the, the 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 revisions that we made for the final proposed regulatory reforms uh, and proposals. But uh, you know, it it takes a lot of time to for for agencies to change their their uh, regulations, their um, yeah their frameworks. So. Right now, actually, the project is ongoing, but this time it's um, it's uh, funded by the U.S. Department of State, um, and we are continuing to to um, cooperate or to coordinate with the agencies. It will have to be a department department. So some of the some of the uh, proposals require uh, that some departments have joint memorandum circulars or issue joint memorandum circulars. And things like that. So it will it will really be a really a top level uh, um, decision, and it's not that easy. But we ha we we can only just provide uh, recommendations. But thank you for that question. Very good question. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Or maybe we can have a word from the donor. Yeah. Or some comments. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. Go. Um, Hello, Lorna. Hi. Uh, so uh, right now we receive those LNGs in containers. Or do they get repackaged after receipt of the port? Yeah, they we receive them as LNG from the ships, and then they are stored. They will be stored because the these are 
these are still uh, projects that are ongoing, so under construction. So they will be stored in uh, cryogenic tanks in uh, import facilities or oh. FSR use. Yeah. So right now, what kind of gas is, what, what are those gases that are also in the gasol uh, ah, tank? Those are uh, no, LPG, ma'am. LPG. LPG. So this is this is a proposal so we can accommodate uh, delivery of uh, LNG. Yes, uh, it's mainly a, a, a study to assist the Department of Energy in uh, implementing the the regulation that they have uh, that they have uh, yeah uh, written or issued. Yeah. Okay. And it's uh, it's it's a continuing study, ma'am. Right now, with the uh, USDS, um, we are trying to provide um, feasibility studies as well as uh, economic um, information to help uh, investors from the US as well as from other countries uh, to see if there is uh, more there could be more use for the LNG that we will be importing. Oh, are there other Asian countries? countries that are already accepting imports of uh, LNG? Well, of course, Japan is the one of the uh, biggest import importers, of course. Uh, and uh, well, I think Vietnam is also mm -hmm. importing. And uh, Indonesia is uh, pro uh, is producing its own. Well, that, that was a lot of work that you guys did. So, ah, okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank I'll you, ma'am. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, po, ma'am. It was an honor to have you here. Yeah. All right. Maraming salamat po, ma'am Babylin, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next uh, presenter is a recipient of the Mainilad Professorial Chair. He is Dr. Florencio Ballesteros, Jr., and this research is entitled Effect of Current Density, Value, and Current Application Period on the Wastewater Treatment Performance of Electrochemically Enhanced Self-Forming Dynamic Membrane Bioreactors. So if you are ready, uh, Sir Jun. Can you see my slide? Yes, Pop. Okay. Yeah, uh, apologies for changing the title. Uh, to I, I did that to reflect uh, the uh, contents of my uh, slides more. That's okay, but okay. Uh, uh, so this is on uh, wastewater treatment and uh, membrane uh, and uh, what they call this to uh, to address the uh, problem of uh, falling uh, falling in uh, the membranes. As you know, if there's a, a uh, there's a fast uh, relatively uh, uh, formation of uh, falling of falling in the membranes, it will. Uh, decrease the uh, service life of these membranes and this will become costly and uh, so also in the um, in the current uh, regulatory atmosphere of stricter uh, influence standards uh, we are this uh, research supposed to uh, address the uh, problem of uh, uh, biological nutrients uh, that is now uh, regulated as mainly uh, nitrogen and phosphorus including uh, the uh, emerging contaminant, uh, contaminants uh, like uh, antibiotics and uh, uh, for other pharmaceuticals okay so what are the self-forming dynamic membrane bioreactors uh, as the name suggests it's a membrane um, but it's uh, qualified further by this term self-forming. Uh, self-forming uh, is achieved by combination of uh, the proper micro, uh, microbial consortia and together with some operational parameters uh, for this uh, uh, during uh, this uh, reactor, uh, reactor uh, operation. So it utilizes biological layer and this is your biofilm. And then uh, it also has the uh, uh, advantage of uh, you may, can use uh, locus uh, uh, filter material it can be locally uh, uh, produced. And then because of the falling control, uh, we are able to lower the filtration resistance and increase the service time of these uh, membranes. Now, the challenges that uh, 
as I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier that uh, under the present regulatory atmosphere, uh, we most of the treatment plants uh, have been uh, designed uh, uh, for the conventional parameters, and down, down they have to be upgraded to uh, control nitrogen and phosphorus. So that's contributing to lower uh, effluent quality, especially uh, for uh, especially for conventional time. And then also uh, we are. Uh, having problems on stability of this uh, uh, SFDM to uh, produce a consistent effluent quality. And then uh, we try to address that in our methodology. Now, uh, this is encapsulated, meaning the membrane is enclosed in a uh, we call two layers of support material. So to prevent the direct exposure to environmental stress, stressors such as aeration. And because of this, uh, uh, because of uh, if there's a uh, um, vigorous aeration process, it can dislodge the uh, biofilm. And uh, also, uh, this is also to uh, uh, affect the, uh, uh, or achieve the uh, anoxic and anaerobic uh, and uh, aerobic uh, uh, cycles that are necessary to remove the nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, so uh, we tried to investigate the formal performance of the uh, encapsulated self-forming dynamic membrane to uh, as against its uh, pollutant remo removal uh, capacity, and then to alleviate uh, the problem of uh, membrane fouling. So we also look at uh, these uh, microorganisms that are uh, are predominant and are responsible for this uh, the good performance of these. Uh, uh, membrane bioreactor. So these are the um, materials and methods. We have the uh, 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 self-forming membrane uh, immersed in the, re in, the, in the reactor. And uh, we uh, applied uh, the, uh, also these uh, electric, electric, electrical processes in the uh, reactor itself. And uh, we have this, uh, we use the synthetic we use water. And then uh, we also had to uh, monitor the uh, uh, concentrations of uh, our the parameters that we have uh, uh, that we are monitoring uh, that we have uh, decided on to monitor. So these are the effluent rate. If it's listed there, the permeate flux, working volume, and then the filtration cycle. And then we have this also uh, specified the pore, pore size of the support material. Okay, so this is uh, the schematic uh, diagram of the membrane. You have that the foul, uh, the uh, membrane is in, again is enclosed to uh, prevent uh, sloughing off by uh, vigorous uh, uh, aeration during the operation of the reactor. And then so. Uh, you, the permian is supposed to uh, come up with the uh, uh, effluent, uh, good, a good quality of effluent. So the enclo enclosure is uh, made of uh, your PVC mesh and then also the reductant mesh. All right, so what are the parameters that we have, uh, we are, have set on to uh, monitor? So we uh, looked at the uh, biomass growth and this is indicated by your MLSS, uh, MLVSS, the organic pollutants removal, COD. Uh, we, uh, we prefer COD because this, is, uh, this will just take two hours to, uh, uh, for the results to come out, as opposed to BOD, which is a five-day uh, five process. We uh, monitored nitrogen, phosphorus, and the, uh, ammonia and uh, nitrates, and then the turbidity. Huh? or the uh, turbidity in the effluent, and then the mitigation of fouling, uh, and as indicated by transmembrane pressure, and then the presence of uh, EPS or the extracellular polymeric substances, soluble micro, micro, uh, microbial products, and the uh, TEP, transparent polymer particles. And we get those, uh, uh, sam we get the samples from the uh, reactor itself. So results and discussion. You can see here, uh, COD at the upper uh, graph, and then uh, the DOC at the lower graph. Uh, looking at the COD upper graph, 
uh, I can see there uh, there uh, from the start we have uh, already quite the uh, we we have already a reduction in the uh, COD from the in the effluent, and then uh, it's uh, it, it is uh, it is it's uh, relatively uh, constant uh, as we, as time goes on. The same is true with your DOC. So the uh, it is obtained a reduction of about ninety five percent, and the DOC reduction of uh, similarly uh, uh, similar uh, value. So comparing this uh, self forming dynamic membrane to, to uh, that of uh, the uh, conventional membrane bioreactor, you can see here uh, the uh, the good quality. Huh? The nitrogen and phosphorus removal were equal. To uh, the uh, and respectively, we are higher compared to that of the uh, MBR, conventional MBR. Um, also, uh, in the reduction of uh, nitrate concentration in the reactor, you can see the same uh, behavior. And in the in the reactor, you have that also in the nitrification, which uh, really, uh, which is the last process in removal of your of your nitrogen. Your ammonia is, uh, is converted to nitrate in aerobic conditions, and then under anoxic conditions, uh, you convert the nitrate to nitrogen gas, and then which uh, escapes from your system, thus eradicating nitrogen in the uh, wastewater. So uh, this also gives uh, the uh, lists these uh, the other. Uh, um, parameters related to uh, the, the microbial consortia. And these are the SMPs, uh, EPS, and the following rate. So uh, the uh, reduced uh, concentration of membrane firing substances and lower membrane firing rate are have been observed in our present setup compared to uh, the ones uh, of MBR that's reported in literature. Okay, so uh, as I, I said again earlier, the uh, self-forming the, the, the dynamic membrane is uh, uh, achieved by a uh, combination of uh, the specific or the, uh, combination of specific microbial consortia together with the uh, with operational characteristics, operational uh, uh, procedures in the uh, Removal uh, wastewater treatment process, and as you can see here uh, the different uh, species of, uh, of microorganisms that are present in the mixed liquor, in the membrane itself, and in the effluent. Okay, so uh, again, this is also uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, results that we have. The effluent is quite low, uh, one point one six, point five three, and then. Uh, 2.33 huh? this uh, microbial community uh, that's the uh, it's comparable right? comparable the diversity in uh, that is uh, present in our reactor systems comparable to those reported in literature okay. conclusions it is uh, the uh, setup that we have uh, uh, designed obtain a cod and the oc removal efficiencies about of, uh, 95 uh, plus percent, uh, and then the significantly higher removal of nit uh, ammonia and phos uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in the uh, uh, self-forming dynamic membrane, uh, thus, thus addressing the problem of uh, uh, coming up or achieve uh, coming up with uh, a good effluent quality that will, so, uh, so that will uh, uh, fulfill or uh, uh, this to. Uh, fulfill or uh, pass the effluent standards uh, uh, stated, by, uh, stated by the regula regulatory agency. Lower concentrations of pollen precursors, thus increasing the uh, serviceability or service life of your membranes where you have to change them. Higher total count and microbial diversity has also been observed in our present setup. Uh, this has been uh, published uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the results of this in uh, the Journal of uh, Science of the Total of Total and uh, of the Total Environment, 
And lastly, I would like to acknowledge uh, the following entities, the University of Salerno for providing us with uh, the, our um, co-advisor for this uh, research and uh, research support. And then the DOSD for my uh, advice uh, scholarships. And then my Nila Water Services for this uh, professorial chair award. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chuan Ballesteros. And I think we have a, a time for a few questions from the audience. Okay, anyone? Uh, Doc, I do have a question. For, Please. Can you tell us something about the technology readiness of this uh, uh, new uh, membrane? Um, is it ready for deployment or do we have a prototype? Uh, right now, uh, it's in the pilot stage, uh, pilot scale. Uh, mm -hmm. The one we had the research. We started with the laboratory and then come up with the, the results that we gave, gave. We verified that in the pilot scale. So uh, the next step would be uh, for commercialization of this uh, setup. And uh, uh, we hope that we'll have the same results as we have uh, uh, seen in both uh, laboratory and the pilot scale uh, mm. uh, studies. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? All right, uh, Goran, go ahead. Hello po. Uh, Maki-clarify lang po ako ng something sa materials and methods. Uh, I'm not sure po kung uh, na-catch ko po yung nasabi niyo po, pero could you explain how um, transparent exopolymer particles po affect uh, membrane fouling? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, this, uh, uh, the EPS that's released uh, by the... Uh, uh, by the microorganisms, uh, our function uh, is a function of the uh, membrane membrane uh, pressure uh, because that uh, that condition can alter the uh, the uh, call this the uh, balance of uh, these microorganisms, the diversity of these microorganisms that can be uh, that can uh, call this uh, cause the growth of these uh, membrane fouling systems. So, you know, the effect lang niya is uh, to uh, uh, really disturb or the uh, disturb the uh, equilibrium uh, or the uh, well, this the uh, cooperation of the different micro of the different microbes in the consortia to uh, to check on those that, that will be detrimental to the uh, formation of the membrane. Understood, but thank you, sir. Thank you, also. All right. Do you have any more uh, questions from the audience? I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Is, is there any comparison made as to the cost, uh, uh, the cost-like uh, reduction as compared to comparable technology, wishing to have the same results uh, in this process? Well, the present, the present develop, uh, development of status of these research is that we, we haven't uh, actually uh, given an uh, extensive uh, uh, evaluation of the cost of this, but uh, we are expecting that since this is just a retrofit of, uh, of uh, the conventional reactors that, we, that are used in use today, it would be uh, a, it won't cost much. Did I answer your question, Mr. Bernardo? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Because uh, one of the concerns also is the downtime. When you are already in the process, uh, if it takes a long time to, you know, to replace or uh, when there is downtime, then that also adds to the cost of the, the process. Yeah. Uh, usually, there are two uh, membranes that are in, uh, in operation at this, at, at this time. So uh, one can be, uh, uh, can take... Uh, Take the place of the other that is in being uh, in, in uh, out of service for that time. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the uh, cost would be really uh, uh, decreased because we are 
uh, increasing the serviceability of this uh, uh, membrane, and which can translate to uh, uh, to call this the uh, the downtime to be uh, parang, uh, it can be uh, called this uh, cancelled out. The uh, additional cost can be cancelled out by the savings in serviceability life of the membrane. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you, sir. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. John Ballesteros, for that wonderful okay. presentation. Pleasure, thank you. Okay, so let's proceed to the next presenter, who is our second to the last presenter. He is the recipient of the 2021 Marubeni Professorial Chair, and his research is entitled Designed Improvement to T cell Immunotherapy by Multidimensional Single Cell Profiling. So let's have Dr. J.R. Adulashon. Sir, can you come uh, online? Nakamute po kayo, Doc? Sorry about that. Didn't realize it. All right po, go ahead. All right, uh, just to check, can you guys see my slides? Yes, Pa. Okay. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. So before I begin, I would like to take this opportunity to first thank the Marubeni Corporation for making this professorial chair lecture possible. So this afternoon, I'll be sharing with you the work that I did during my PhD. All right, and as you can see from the animated GIF, it involves how a component of your immune system called T cells is able to fight the uncontrolled pro proliferation of your own cells, which is known as cancer. So this is work that was published this year back in March, and it's a lab paper. It spans several years of work, and it's been made possible by the numerous contributions of all the people you see listed on to discuss only a small portion of it. And, and I'll be focusing on the kinetic modeling, which aims to understand why some T cells are better at killing others. All right. So before we dive in, let's first watch this video. Inside all of us lurks a serial killer a killer whose primary function is to kill and then kill again. These are cytotoxic T cells, a specialized member of our white blood cells. They patrol our bodies, identifying and destroying virally infected and cancer cells. And they do so with remarkable precision and efficiency. There are about 5 million T cells in a teaspoon of our blood engaged in the ferocious and unrelenting battle to keep us healthy. These amorphous blobs move around quite rapidly, pushing out their leading edge and probing their environment as they go. When a cytotoxic T cell finds a cancer cell, membrane protrusions rapidly explore the surface of the cell, checking for the telltale signs of cancer. They kill their targets using poisonous proteins visible here in red. These cytotoxic granules move down special pathways in the cell called microtubules to the interface between the T cell and the cancer cell. The T cell punctures the surface of the cancer cell and delivers its deadly cytotoxins. This is very important in our bodies where cells are packed together as it focuses the lethal hit on the target and minimizes collateral damage to the neighboring healthy cells. The fate of the cancer cell is sealed. The T cell then moves on, hungry to find another victim. All right, so the idea is uh, your body's T cells can fight tumor cells that eventually becomes cancer when left un uh, unchecked. However, since we see cancer, it must mean that tumor cells are able to find a way to evade our body's T cells. And thus, one way to enhance the ability of our body's T cells is to 
take some of them out of your body, genetically modify them so that they display a synthetic receptor on their surface called a chimeric antigen receptor. This scar allows it to home onto these evasive tumor cells. And now you have your CAR T cells, you propagate them to a certain concentration until they're ready for infusion back into the patient. So as such, it's known as a living drug as it's its cells and is able to multiply in the patient's body and kill the tumor cells that it recognized using that synthetic receptor. And there are a lot of success stories with this kind of therapy, all right, involving blood cancers and cancers involving the lymphatic system. All right. And one of the and one thing we should take note of these uh, cases is that these are patients that failed primary treatment, which is chemotherapy. All right, so essentially for these people, immunotherapy, CAR T cell therapy served as a lifeline for these uh, patients. However, despite the numbers that we're, the promising numbers that we're seeing, it would be nice if we could push these numbers higher, having more people respond to this type of treatment. And thus, the idea is since we have CAR T cells not working in some of these patients, maybe we can take those non-killer T cells and compare them with killer T cells. And maybe if we do it on a single cell level, we might be able to filter. And if we and if we okay, there's something about okay. Apologies, my Zoom session is acting weird. So let me redo this. All right. So there is evidence from the literature that these T cells are able to kill multiple times. So there is a way to ramp up the rate of killing of these T cells. So in order to answer that question, I think we, or we believe that it's key to understand the mechanics, mechanistic basis of this killing action. All right. Hello, sir. Sorry, hello. Uh, okay. Can I ask where did I stop? Uh, can you just show the slide so we can see your letter? All right, sorry about this. Uh, can you see uh, my slides now? Before that, sir. That's Was this the last one? Yes, yes. All right, sorry about that. Uh, for some reason, my Zoom session keeps logging me out. <laughs> Anyways, um, so going back to this slide, so the idea here is if we can take those non-killer T-cells from patients who didn't respond to CAR T-cell therapy, compare them with killer T-cells for patients that responded to CAR T-cell therapy, maybe we can find clues on the single cell level on how to improve this treatment modality. And we have uh, evidence from the literature showing that T-cells can kill multiple times, all right? And Thus, it's possible to ramp up the rate of killing. And a uh, key we believe on, on doing this is to understand on uh, the mechanism that governs this killing process. All right. And in order to perform this single cell profiling, so the lab developed its in-house microscopy platform called Timing. Uh, essentially, it's, it involves a polymer chip made of PDMS has holes or wells in it. And inside you have different cells seeded in it, all right? T cells and tumor cells. These are loaded onto a special microscope that takes videos, all right? And these videos are image processed into a table of values. So 
An example of such videos taken by this uh, platform is this one here. So we have here a well containing four cells. One is a T cell, the other three are tumor cells. And that's one dead tumor cell. Now the T cell is in, uh, in contact with the second one and now it's dead. All right, so what information can we get from this what kinds of videos? We can get temporal information. We can get uh, morphological information as well as information regarding motility or how fast they move. All right, and for this particular talk, I'll be sharing with you the model that we were able to uh, find for one of the temporal information that we or data that we obtained from the system, which is T contact how long the T cell is in contact with the tumor cell. And for the model, we borrow the concept from chemical kinetics. All right, so we have here a two-step process comprised of two irreversible first order reactions. Equal, uh, when the rate constants are not equal, it, solves, uh, it can be solved to yield this equation here. If the rate constants are equal, it reduces to this equation here. And we can generalize this process to an n-step process, all rate constants equal. At the end, we are able to derive this expression here, which turns out to be a gamma distribution. And this gamma distribution has the following form. When n is equal to 1, it is an exponential decay. When it's greater than 1, it gives you peaks. All right, so using this model, all right, so we have here profiles uh, for this, let's say, reaction different species of A, B, C, D, E, and a product F. All right, so if you integrate these profiles, you get the one here at the bottom. All right, so these profiles assume constant rate, uh, the rate constants are all equal. If we relax that condition and we let one or more rate constants to be not equal, all right, like for this example here, we see that the gamma distribution does a reasonable job of fitting the data. All right, and we can see here that the number of steps now is no longer an integer, it's a non-integer indicating that there is, a, there is one or more rate determining steps in the system. Again, if we integrate these curves, we get the, the profiles that we see here at the bottom. Also, we can have uh, multimodal distributions, for example, the, the one that we see here for, the, uh, for species E, and we can interpret this as the presence of one or more parallel uh, reactions, each one governed by a gamma distribution. When you integrate, uh, of course, and when you integrate this one, same, as, same argument as before, you get these profiles here at the bottom. All right, now we're going to use these profiles for the next slide. So what will happen is uh, we will subtract this plot here at the bottom, subtract it from one, and this is what we get. So as you can see here, this is one minus the gamma distribution fit. And we have here the fit, the red curve, and we have here the, the rectangles, which is based on the experimental data. All right, so we have here on the top killers, the fraction that killed, the one at the bottom, the fraction that did not kill. All right, and we have here up to three instances where the T cell meets a different tumor cell. All right, and what we see here is that for cases that it killed, the tumor cell killed, we are seeing a more or less reasonable fit with respect to the data. And we see that the number of steps is some number greater than one, indicating that there is a rate determining step for, these, uh, for, the, for this process. Now, if we look at non-killers at the bottom, we find that the number of steps is less than one. And we also see that the fit is not that good relative to our, to, uh, to our killers here. And one way to interpret this is if this is like the expected behavior of our T cells, basically this is a plot of how many cells are in contact at the start. And as you can see, as time passes by, more and more T cells disengage from the tumor cells. So here we can see that there, if this is the expected num uh, number, there are more T cells disengaging than expected. There, over here, there are more, more T cells attached to, our, to the tumor cells than uh, expected, indicating that we have probably two or more 
subpopulations, each one probably bearing one or more uh, uh, failure rates in terms of the steps that leads to killing. Uh, killing. So in order to understand this uh, graphs uh, better, it's better, it would be good to frame it in terms of the actual steps or processes that occur in our cells. So this is a cartoon depicting what we believe are steps that occur during killing. So you have here your T cell, this is your tumor cell. First step is the T cell attaches itself to their tum uh, tumor cell, it's called conjugation. Your T cell contains granules. Then the next step would be these this granules migrate toward where, it, where the T, T, uh, T cell is in contact with the tumor cell. So this is called polarization or basically the concentration of granules at this location here. All right, and once it's ready, it can inject this toxic payload onto the tumor cell. That's called the granulation, and that causes the tumor cell to die, and the T cell lives to uh, kill another tumor cell. So these are the steps that we we uh, think are happening. All right, and with that, uh, so what uh, what we did here is, is to uh, stain the granules green. All right, and we'll look at two different videos to, uh, uh, looking at killer and non-killer T cell fractions. So for the killer T cell fraction. So as we can see here, we can, we can see polarization, the concentration of the granules onto where the T cell meets the tumor cell. Now for the non-killer T cell fraction, so this is a representative example. All right, so as we can see here, these are the granules here and they're not polarized toward where the T cell meets the tumor cell. All right, so we see that difference between killers, uh, killers and non-killers. And so on the next slide, a uh, member of the lab, Rasindu, uh, did this work here where he looked at 30 or more events manually, okay, looking at, uh, diff, uh, uh, at uh, uh, the cases that, you, we, that we watched earlier in the previous uh, slide. All right, and the idea here is you have granules spread throughout the T cell. And the idea is we want to have a number to represent that dispersion. So what we chose here is variance. So the more spread out the granules are in your cell, in your T cell, the larger will be the variance. And as they concentrate toward the location, as they polarize, the variance decreases towards zero. And that's what we see here for this case of killing. All right, at the start, we see polar, uh, the polarization of granules. Then upon contact, we see here that the variance decreases indicating that our granules are converging. All right. Now for the second case here, we, we don't see that convergence indicating that there is a failure uh, to polarize. All right. And for the third case here, we uh, following that logic of tracking down the spread of the granules inside your T cell, we see that there is this decrease in variance indicating there is polarization, but the result, it, uh, but that didn't result to killing of the tumor cell, indicating that there must be failure right after polarization. And the one that we can think of based on the previous model or, or, or schematic would be degranulation. It assembled at the entrance or at the, at the point where the T cell is in contact with the tumor cell, but the T cell didn't inject it's toxic payload, all right? And with that, we, uh, we find that doing these microscopy experiments are not easy. So being able to, and being guided by some mathematical model for this case, gamma distribution allows us to have an idea what to look for in these systems. And thus we are able to see cases where we see multiple modes of failure involving lysosomal polarization or degranulation. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my lab where I spent my PhD in Houston, as well as the Marubeni Corporation for their general support for this professorial chair. And with that, thank you for listening. Thank you, Paul, sir, JR.
So unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. So if you can just directly contact uh, Sir JR and then he can answer your questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Sorry about the technical problems. Yes, that's all right. So our uh, last but not the least uh, presenter for today is the recipient of the Chua Leung and Loretta D. Professorial Chair. And the title of his research is University of the Philippines Diliman Chemical Engineering Plant Design Course, Addressing Student Outcomes on Engineering Design. And we have none other than Sir Bemboy Nino Sobosa. Sir Bemboy, are you here? Hi, good afternoon. Um... Sir Carl, could you confirm if you can see the shared screen right now? Yes, complete ah. screen. Okay. Go Thank ahead. you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am presenting today a paper co-authored with um, engineer uh, Paul Jack Nalzaro and Dr. Rizalinda de Leon. Our paper is entitled The University of the Philippines Diliman Chemical Engineering Plant Design Course, Addressing Student Outcomes on Engineering Design. So... Uh, in 2018, the Philippine Technological Council, through its Accreditation and Certification Board for Engineering and Technology, or ACBET, gave partial accreditation to the BSCHE program of UP Diliman. So the purpose of accreditation for engineering programs in the Philippines under the PPC is to assure quality engineering education that is globally competitive. And the criteria for accreditation include um, fulfillment of program educational objectives and student outcomes, uh, system in place for continuous quality improvement, and so on. So for this paper, we focused our attention on how the plant design courses of UPD check, uh, that's CHE 141 and CHE 142, fulfill uh, certain selected student outcomes specified by PTC as one of their criteria. So according to the PTC, an engineering program must demonstrate that its graduate possess the attributes of its student outcomes by the time of graduation. So graduates are expected to build on this foundation as they progress with their practice of engineering. There are 12 student outcomes uh, that were specified and UPD check in its review process leading to accreditation uh, identified six student outcomes that are addressed by its plant design courses. So for this paper, we look at two uh, student outcomes on engineering design. Uh, that's student outcome number three, or the ability to design a system component or process to meet the desired needs within realistic constraints. And student outcome number five, or the ability to identify, formulate, and solve engineering problems. Uh, engineering design is an important component in capstone projects. So capstone design courses uh, bridge the gap between school and professional practice, and they provide students the opportunity to apply lifelong learning and sound engineering judgment. And the project-based learning in a capstone design course integrates um, fundamental knowledge with the practical side of engineering design. So the policies, standards, and guidelines of, uh, for the BSAHE program, uh, as adopted by CHED, has mandated that any higher education institute in the country offering a four-year degree program on chemical engineering must offer a minimum of two capstone courses uh, on chemical engineering design. So that's chemical engineering design one and two. Uh, these courses must be taken as a senior level courses with lecture and laboratory components meeting every week. So our paper aimed to uh, assess the effectiveness of the plant design courses in achieving their course outcomes and the selected student outcomes of the degree program. Uh, specifically, we aim to analyze the correspondence between the course outcomes and the two selected student outcomes. And we also aim to determine the student's perception uh, of the extent of their learning and that of meeting uh, the course objectives. So to examine the correspondence between the course outcomes and uh, student output, we obtain descriptions of the courses content uh, and the laboratory activities and deliverables from the course syllabus. Uh, these were set side by side to show, to, uh, show correspondence. Um, we also used rubrics, evaluation forms, and consultation forms to indicate implementation of individual student contributions to the group outputs as well as individual reporting during the consultations. 
Uh, we also obtained student feedback through the responses uh, in the semestral SET results for CHE 141 and 142. So the student evaluation of teaching or SET uh, is an online, online module employed by UP Diliman to collect feedback on the students' learning experience and evaluation of the handling of the courses uh, that they were enrolled in the semester. So we used results on two questions from the SET, the extent of the students' learning and the attainment of the course outcomes. So uh, the plant design course in the BS Chemical Engineering Program in UP Diliman spans two semesters. Uh, the first semester course, CHE 141, is credited with two units of lecture and one unit laboratory, while the second semester course, CHE 142, has one unit lecture and two units of lab. Uh, the UP Diliman BSHE program also uses a five-year curriculum until uh, the year 2017. So the new four-year curriculum started its implementation in academic year 2018. Uh, the five-year curriculum continues to be offered until the last cohort uh, graduates this academic year. So uh, exams are given for the lecture part while weekly requirements are submitted in the laboratory sessions. A written report is submit submitted at the end of each course. Um, the output from the first semester course uh, serves as the starting point for the second semester course. And uh, a hardbound plan design report is the ultimate output for the two semester uh, capstone project. So students work on uh, the year long cap capstone project in groups of three or four. A group leader is designated and tasked to ensure equitable distribution of tasks. Um, preparation of agenda for each consultation and um, timely delivery of weekly requirements as indicated in the syllabus. So these requirements are reported and discussed with their um, plant design advisor who will then rate the students based on the soundness and the completeness of their deliverable. Uh, consult consultation meetings and with the advisor provide opportunities for the group to discuss uh, strategies for addressing concerns and problems encountered in the project during, uh, during the past week. So the course content of both CHE 141 and 142 and the weekly laboratory uh, deliverables are all outlined in the course syllabus usually distributed at the start of the semester. Uh, CHE 141 covers topics that lead to the development of a conceptual feasibility study, while CHE 142 covers topics on the development of piping and instrumentation diagrams, uh, detailed design of equipment, and the conduct of a hazard and operability study. So um, to show congruence between the final student output of the capstone project and the identified course outcomes, we mapped, the, we mapped out the parts of the end of term report uh, with the course outcomes. So uh, for example, uh, chapter four on process synthesis and development addresses the course outcome on applying CHE principles and heuristics in generating a process flow diagram. Uh, chapter four of the CHE 141 feasibility report discusses the processes and the decisions made in the synthesis of the process flow sheet. Uh, another example is chapter seven on the profitability analysis addressing two uh, outcomes on economics. So chapter seven contains calculations on net present value, return on investment and payback period. It also includes a sensitivity analysis to address risks um, post by making assumptions and rough uh, estimations. We also did the same mapping for course outcomes of CHE 142 against the content of the plant design report submitted at the end of the second semester. So the course outcome on the detailed sizing of uh, static and rotate, rotating equipment are addressed by uh, several chapters. That's chapter four, five, and six. So those are data sheets. Um, that are found in those three chap chapters. And uh, the detailed design methodology are documented in one of the appendices. So uh, for the course outcomes on technical presentations, the students are required to uh, present the results through an oral presentation at the end of the semester. So uh, to validate the course outcomes, if they are indeed achieved, um, other tools were used such as rubrics on the evaluation of reports, um, individual evaluations by the advisors during consultations, and peer evaluation at the end of the semester. So the advisor evaluates um, the final manuscripts submitted per semester using a set of rubrics for every report section. So we show a portion of the rubrics here. 
Um, for example, generally a report component is considered or rated exemplary if the content is correct, well composed, uh, consistent with technical standards, and well supported by calculations and explanations. So any deviation, um, depending on the extent of that deviation, would result in a rating of either accomplished, uh, developing, or missing, uh, or unacceptable. We also show here uh, a sample of hands consultation form and peer evaluation form. Uh, the peer evaluation form is accomplished and submitted individually and includes a self-evaluation and an assessment of the leader and the group mates and a matrix of contributions from each uh, group member. So we also use the SEP to determine feedback on two items, the extent of the student learning, the extent at which the course, and the extent at which the course outcomes were met. So the results collected were limited to SEPs uh, collected during the academic years 2016 to 2017, 2017 to 2018, and 2018 to 2019. So the first question from the SEP that we processed was, uh, how much have you learned from the from this course? So responses were categorized according to a five-point Likert scale. Uh, that's very much, much, some, very little, and nothing. So we pre present here separately uh, the results for the lecture and lab classes for the last uh, three years. So based on the collected responses, majority of the respondents indicated that they received a substantial amount of learning from the lecture and laboratory classes of CHE 141 and 142. The percentage of responses for the positive points uh, on the scale for the evaluation of the lab classes are higher than the ones for the uh, lecture classes. So this is the case because since weekly consultations for the lab classes are more hands-on than the lecture, students are expected to respond better to that setup. So hence, the percentage of responses towards greater learning is higher for the lab classes. Uh, the second question that we processed was to what extent have the objectives of this course been attained? So again, the responses were categorized according to the five-point Likert scale. And uh, the three, all three years show greater percentages or responses from the positive points on the scale than the negative points. Uh, majority of the respondents indicated that almost all of the course outcomes were achieved by the end of the semester. So uh, this concludes our paper. Our aim was to assess the effectiveness of the plant design courses of the BSEG program uh, and uh, check if they achieve their indicated course outcomes. So congruences between lecture and, and laboratory components were uh, summarized and the students' feedback on the extent of their learning experience uh, were also presented. So uh, we hope to extend the same analysis to the other student outcomes of the program. And, um, the program is also up for review for the PTC ACBET uh, in the next year, I guess, or next two years. So it is also um, urgent for, the, for a program-wide assessment on how our, our courses demonstrate the attainment of the student outcomes. And finally, uh, various adjustments have been made to several of our undergraduate courses since the pandemic started because of university policy and voluntary adjustment by the faculty involved. So. Um, it would be good if we could extend this methodology to courses offered during the pandemic. So uh, before I end, we would like to thank Ms. Audrey Umol for helping us compile the set results. And um, we would also like to extend our gratitude to all the lecture and lab instructors of CHE 141 and 142 who have designed, developed, taught, and perfected the two courses since their inception. I would also like to thank um, the donors of the Chua Leong and Loretta D. Professorial Chair Award and the organizers of this year's colloquium for um, the opportunity to present this paper. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Bemboy Nino Sabosa. And the floor is now open for a few questions. Sir Bemboy, I do have a question. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Apparently, there are students who said that they learned nothing in <laughs> one for one, <laughs> one for two. How can we address this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think um, at the top of my head, uh, the best course of action would be to do a regular assessment rather than the usual assessment at the end of the semester. I think that's also 
the same for all programs. Um, rather than having an end of the semester assessment, um, the, sem the, 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 the the assessment or I think the feedback should be given regularly, like once a week or after every consultation session or even after um, every lecture session. So there are learning strategies that uh, utilize that. For example, uh, using a minute paper where you give your students one minute to write your their any questions that they have or any misunderstandings that they have about the lesson. So yeah, that's one active learning strategy that we can employ so that you know we can avoid um, getting that nothing rate at the end of the sem. Thank you, sir. And uh, I think it's also good to extend this to other subjects in our yeah. curriculum. Yes, yeah. especially since we're about to, or the accreditation period is about to end, I guess. So mm -hmm. I think Sir Brian mentioned now we're also up for applying for another round of accreditation. All right. Any more questions from the audience? Do we have students here? Okay, I think uh, no one is uh, raising their hand. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Sir Ben Boy Nino Sabasa. Thank you, thank you. And that wraps up our professorial chair colloquium for today. And so uh, in the remaining minutes, let me just, since the synthesize and uh, uh, let's have some concluding remarks uh, about our session today. So we have seen a lot of researches since the morning session. And we know that it, uh, it was difficult to conduct research uh, during the pandemic. But our researchers have persisted and produced quality research despite the difficulty of our situation. And with that, we sincerely thank the donors who continue to support our research. We could not have done it without your support. So let's give a round of applause to our donors and our researchers as well.